Hi, Rob. Hey, how you doing, mate? I'm all right, I'm all right. I've just been bouncing from one, bit, one webinar to another for the last two it's hours. It's crazy. <laughs> Whilst I was, so the managing Dom's one earlier on, which was stunning. He set the bar bloody high, my God. Um, there was loads of other webinars coming through. I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this. No, <laughs> it's too much information. But there you go. Okay, so. Disable my camera. Uh, oh, sorry, let me do it, let me do it, sorry. Uh, just enlarge that. Um, mm -hmm. Participants, more my co host. There you go. You're, you are now co host. So, so if you go down to the bottom corner, you should be able to <laughs> enable your camera. Start video. Voila. Hey, yes. dude. I'm liking your background. Oh. <laughs> well, it's not yeah. actually right now, but it is actually quite nice out there. But... <laughs> lovely, lovely. The use of green screen. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, so we've got well over 600 people registered. I know, mate. <laughs> mate. Oh, my God. There might be a couple from overseas, I think, mate. Do you remember? Did you ever meet Lawrence Aiken? He used to work for I Martin. did, yes. Oh, I would. He's, he's in uh, Grand Rapids in Michigan. So oh, he's in very nice, very nice. It sounds good, sounds good. Um, <laughs> so I've actually upgraded the account to accommodate all your extras, which is good. Oh, Always happy to do that. Uh, so we'll make a recording of it, uh, and then we'll edit, it, edit that down in the next few days, and then just release that again for free, as long as you're happy. Uh, Question wise, uh, what tends what tends to work quite well is is it kind of the questions people will ask questions usually by just the chat, uh, yeah. and then if it's a if it's kind of a, a good question that doesn't that's kind of fits with what you're talking about at the time, I'll just say I'll I'll, I'll just kind of pass I'll 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 put my mic up and my, my video up and just say oh. Quick question here. Yeah, yeah, it's not me because I won't look at. I try, I used to look at the chat room. It just it's too difficult to do. I, I run webinars myself. It's too difficult to see the chat and run your thing as well. It's just too. It's too. It's too distracting. Uh, so I'll kind of ask any questions that I think are relevant to ask at the time. I'll ask at the time. If there's anything that uh, I think is kind of completely off piste, 
I'll answer it and say, just <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <It's> stupid. <laughs> and, and if it's something that kind of is a good question, but doesn't fit at a time, I'll make a note of it and I'll ask her afterwards at the end. Yeah, no, that's fine. And at the end, I'm, I'll, I'll be here for two okay. days. I think the meeting has officially started. It's done automatically. Oh, nice. Share screen. Okay, okay. So if you want to share your screen, we've got people coming into the room now. Oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic fantastic um that's great that's great okay we'll wait for kind of everybody to come into the room because they're coming in a wee bit early so we're officially due to start at around about uh, two o'clock so we better better not start that's early so that's fine we'll that's distract good. people so how are things going my friend you're, you're over in liverpool now I do a day there, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I still practice in South Manchester and then Liverpool uh, a day week Monday. So uh, oh, they've set up a training programme there, which is quite nice. It's not, not too far away from Manchester. It's nice. Yes. Is Mike Horrock still there? Has he, has he moved on? No, no, Mike, he, he, he was never at Liverpool. He does chess, he does his oh, private yes, chess. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Liverpool's Faddy Jarrod is the course lead there. Uh, yes. Yeah, prof yeah. now. That's Prof. Um, nice. It's quite nice. A small little group of root yeah. canal furglers there, <laughs> <laughs> training the baby root canal furglers. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always good fun. Always, good, always yeah. entertaining. Um, I miss our times at Manchester. It's good times. Good times. It was. I know. It's been blooming ages. I've not. I've not been back there for. It must have been fourteen years. I don't. When did you leave there? Uh, it's probably just before that. Probably about 15, 16 years ago. It's a long time ago, isn't it? My goodness. Time moved on. You living at Leeds or Sheffield or? No, no, I, I don't. And I, I've, I kind of just, just made a, a vague inquiry at the moment as to whether they've got any 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 positions of someone of my calibre over in Sheffield. It's only, up the, it's only 15 miles away from me. It's always yeah. a lot closer than Manchester ever was. Uh, so, so participants who are coming into the room now, uh, we will start at two o'clock. We don't want to start early. Um, we've got well over 600 registered for this one, which is amazing. Uh, and I, again, I want to thank Sam so much for doing this. There's, there's no money being taken any, anywhere or going anywhere for this. It's all free. We're just trying to support our colleagues as best we can at this crazy time. Definitely, definitely. So for people who are already in the room, you're bright and early. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Nikhil Kanani saying, all right, Sanj. Uh, Nitin saying, hi, Sanj. There is a yard. These are the hecklers. This is the problem with writing mates and friends. Uh, I, I, I will manage the hecklers. <laughs> so as I say, as I just saying, Sanj, what, what we'll do is, uh, if you've got any questions, ask on the way through. I just think, certainly for a webinar, presenting them, it can, if, you, if you get no questions, it can be thinking, well, am I on my own here? Is anybody on the other side of the screen? So I think it just keeps people engaged. Uh, so ask the questions. I will field them so that it doesn't distract sound at all. Um, so I'll field them. If there's anything that I think is relevant to ask at the time, I'll, I'll kind of pop, my, I'll pop up and, and ask him the question. Uh, if not, if it kind of fits, but it's not something that uh, it would disturb the flow too much, uh, we'll just ask them at the end. That's um, fine. But we'd expect, as I say, we expect a good meeting. We're early and we've already got hundred over 160 people in the room and they're coming in looking fast. And a couple of questions, they're probably people saying hi. Oh, <laughs> Sonny, how are you doing? Okay. Oh, hello from Greece. Wow. 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 Okay. Good stuff. Back. Oh. <laughs> oh my word, hi from Seattle, Seattle. Oh, Settle. I thought it said Seattle. Settle. Oh, <laughs> there is from Seattle there. And Manchester. Oh, Manchester is always good. Always oh. good in Manchester. Close to home. There we are. That's Manchester in the background. Absolutely. Looking good, mate. Looking good. Dubai going on here in Manchester. 
I think the window you've got there is really good, mate. You've, you've really got it nailed. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was this high up. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. We uh, just to go through the people in the room now. We are recording this presentation. We'll edit it down, so we'll cut out this little bit at the beginning. Uh, hi from Northern Ireland. That's it. Cool. Uh, we're doing a recording of it, uh, and that will be edited down. It will be made available for free for everybody. Uh, I suspect it'll be middle of next week by the time we get that done. Uh, we've got quite a few to go through <laughs> and kind of edit down in, in already. Um, questions, as I say, ask on the way through. Uh, as regards CPD, that will be awarded automatically afterwards. So you will get an email uh, probably in the next three or four days, actually. Uh, hi from Scotland. Uh, that will have a link so you can do the feedback. Uh, and also you'll get your enhanced CPD certificates there and then. Okay. <laughs> okay, the new oh, Sanj dude. Anyone coming lots in from China? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I got that. <laughs> um, no. no. Okay. Oh, Q and A. Uh, oh, Chris, oh, Chris Tavares, your shape, your. My screen shows Pulp Fiction, is that right? It, it is. <laughs> You're in the right place. <laughs> yes. You won the award, Sam, for the best title for a presentation. I, I'm very impressed. Very impressed. This isn't a film show, by the way, unfortunately. That's okay. That's okay. Oh, some more from Dundee. Rosie from Dundee. That's good. From Scotland, rather. Very good. Very good. Time are we? We're two minutes down and counting. Uh, 255 in the room so far. This is good. Oh, keep coming in. Okay, you've officially. Oh, you, you've nearly beaten Dom. Dom O'Hooley had 270 something in this morning, wow. uh, which was cool. amazing. It's a fantastic. If you didn't see it, it was um, a fantastic talk on COVID. He, Dom is one of the brightest guys I know. He's very unassuming, but just so knowledgeable. It's a great presentation, and again, it's it's been recorded, so it will be uploaded. Uh, in I suspect it'll be next week again that we get that done. Yeah, definitely worth seeing that one. Yeah, yeah. Hi from Exeter. Hi there, <laughs> sunny Exeter. Two hundred eighty-eight. You're beaten, Dom. You're beaten, Dom. You've done it. <laughs> one, more, nice. one more minute to go. As I was saying this morning uh, to Dom, uh, we're going to continue these um webinars really for as, as long as we're all in this kind of crazy situation there's a lot of discussion this morning as to how long we think that will be and we just don't know i think we're looking at probably end of may before we get any real significant changes uh hopefully by then we've got the emergency de urgent dental centers sorted out but who knows who knows um so someone's saying where the uploaded, uploaded videos will or where they will be. Uh, they'll be via our, our website, um, but we can share it with Sand as well. Uh, but we'll sort that out for you. We'll give you, we'll, we'll give you a link and say, if you just go back to either our Facebook page, the ProDental Facebook page, or go, go back to our website, you'll see that coming up there for you. Okay. Oh, will uploaded video be on Endo61? I'm sure we could sort something similar like that. Okay. Okay, we're officially two o'clock. Well over 300 people in the room now. Okay, Sand Vanziri. It's been so good to do this. They're all mates who've done this. They've all agreed to do it for nothing. There's no, there's no money changing hands anyway. Nobody's got any money. So we have got, got any money. Yeah. Nobody's got anything. <laughs> um, so we're doing this really just to support our colleagues because we're all in, in a very similar boat. Uh, so, Sam, I used to work with in Manchester for many years. Um, I'm an oral surgeon, so, but I kind of got involved because I, I quite like doing vasectomies and endosurgery, which Sam knows. Uh, but I pass you over to Sam, so any questions, ask on the way through and we'll, we'll, we'll ask them, answer them as best we can. Thank you very much, Rob. I'll just get rid of my uh, photo off the screen. It's not really nice looking at myself. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, if uh, wherever you are. Um, there's some people not in the UK from not the UK here, so welcome to you all. Um, Rob has asked me to do a talk on endo and try to keep uh, something exciting 
to talk find something find exciting to talk about and endo is is uh, it's challenging when it's not a particularly hands-on uh event but uh, so i thought let me jazz it up with a, a title and pulp fiction seemed quite appropriate i had this talk uh, I haven't done this for quite a few years, actually, but things have changed in this area of the pulp, and that's what I want to discuss with you and bring up to speed, because a lot of this is now relevant to general dental practice, uh, not actually relevant too much to us as endodontists, because usually by the time I get a tooth, it's dead, it's been, uh, it's been extirpated, and we have to just do root canal treatment, but uh, things are changing, and you guys in practice, general practice, you get the first... Um, uh, opportunity uh, to treat dental disease and uh, and deal with pulps and uh, rather than just taking the pulp out nowadays we've got a another option which I'll, I'll talk, like to talk to you about today so pulp fiction just to clear up some uh, old-fashioned myths and old-fashioned protocols uh, and introduce you to some new new things new concepts uh, about how we uh, approach these uh, cases so, just a very brief, um, Rob's given me a very nice introduction. This is where I actually qualified, down in London, I'm actually from London, although I'm now in Manchester. Uh, that was Guy's Hospital, that is Guy's Hospital, as it was back in the day, 26, 27 years ago, so a long time ago. Uh, I hadn't been down for quite some time, and I went down about 10, 15 years ago, and there was this big monstrosity right next to the tower um, called the Shard, which is a very nice building, actually, and uh, the London Bridge, which is the area of guys it's, it's a lovely area for those of you not in London worth visiting so that's uh, now part of King's College and that's uh, where I did my uh, undergraduate training I moved pretty much straight up to Manchester after doing uh, years in uh, foundation training I uh, went up to Manchester and that, that's how I met Rob eventually um, this is where I did my endodontic training uh, master's program uh, in those days that was specialist training uh, and I carried on working there for a couple of days a week teaching undergraduates um, uh, on the clinics and that's where I met Rob uh, and then uh, from there I went up to UPlan which is up in Preston uh, a new graduate school relatively new graduate school uh, and I set up the endodontic uh, master's program there and I've left that about 10 years ago and now at Liverpool uh, doing uh, academic training for the specialist training course, the doctorate dental uh, DDSE course as it is, and it's the only specialist training course um, for U UK residents outside Kings and Eastman. So those of you who ever fall into or love, <laughs> want to get into endodontics uh, at a specialist level, do uh, come to see Liverpool. It's a lovely place at the moment, um, just outside Manchester. So Pulp Fiction, let's get down to it. So when we were talking about the pulp, um, the co most common uh, irritants or the most common insults that the, the pulp has to withstand, obviously dental caries is the number one disease, dental disease, um, but also things like fractures, which cause an immediate and quite a large exposure, pulpal exposure, um, which is a different, challenging, but also sometimes more predictable situation, which we'll discuss towards the end of the lecture. Also, the, the procedures that we actually do ourselves, the uh, the insults and the restorative procedures, sometimes elective procedures, we have uh, we do influence and affect the pulp, and this is where sometimes things can go a little bit wrong. Uh, we have to be careful. Long sustained um, tooth wear. Uh, where you've got a long sustained trauma to the pulp uh, where you get a different type of response and sometimes these are more challenging to treat when we decide to rehabilitate these kind of cases where we're doing multiple restorations to re-establish the vertebral dimension uh, and the decision making whether we should root treat these teeth or not and just restore them that can be quite difficult because endodontics can be very difficult in these cases where you've got a lot of calcification. So I'm predominantly going to be discussing caries um, caries, root, uh, fractures, complicated fractures, and some of the procedures. And let's start with some of the procedures that we do. We know from a lot of retrospective uh, studies, um, outcome studies, that fixed prosthodontics, for example, fixed bridge work, the incidence of pulp necrosis can be almost up to one in three of cases, 32%. Uh, and this kind of makes sense because when you're trying to prepare these teeth and realign them with a single path of insertion, if the teeth are not in a favorable position, you sometimes do have to cut very deep into the dentine and you're going to have an effect on the pulp. And in one in three cases, these teeth will devitalize. Uh, sometimes quietly, we don't realize that this happens until um, you start getting problems with apical involvement. When we're talking about single crown units, um, with anything between 30 to 25%, so about say one in five on average of these 
these single crown units, particularly if they're on a if they're on an elective procedure or we're cutting fresh tooth structure. Uh, when I mean tooth, fresh tooth structure, enamel is not an issue, but as soon as we breach the enamel dentine junction into into dentine, fresh dentine that's, for example, not carious uh, in a young patient, that that will that will cause a, a response in the pulp, and we know that. Most of the time we get away with it and patients uh, won't have any problems and there's no signs or symptoms, the pulp will remain the same uh, because the pulp is a very, very resilient organ um, and it withstands short episodes of insults uh, but anything longer sustaining or, or leakage or uh, bacteria leaking into restorations, that, that's what causes the problem. When we're doing our preparations, obviously what is important is to treat the dentine. If we are going to breach the EDJ and go into dentine, our preparations, we need to make sure we treat the dentine with the greatest respect uh, in terms of disinfection, doing our temporization phases. Um, we know that temporary cements are pretty poor. They do leak quite uh, a lot. So um, different concepts such as self-dentine sealing after you prepare them just to seal the dentine tubules during preparation uh, or during temporization. Also the restoration, the material that we use to cement, a lot of them are now resin based, which is, which is great. Uh, and as long as you have good isolation, and these new materials are very predictable and, and give you a very good seal in the longer term. Uh, but do bear in mind when you're doing coronal preparations uh, for bridge and, and bridge work, there is a consent issue. So you need to discuss the possibility that these teeth may devitalize at some point and they need to be warned, uh, aware of this, this risk uh, when you're discussing uh, the treatment plan. Okay. Um, Pulp preservation, uh, caries is predominantly the main area where we've been trying to, to understand and uh, the, the biology and the, the healing response or the lack of healing response in pulps and materials for the last 200 years or so, eugenol materials. So we, we're all familiar with zinc oxide, eugenol, calzenol, sedanol, materials like this. And there's a long history of these materials and they've worked very, very well. Eugenol, the oil, oil of cloves, as, we, as it's commonly known, is it, a very therapeutic material it's an abundant it tends to settle inflammation or, or symptomatic inflammation quite well and it's been used for many years as a, as a sort of a base or a, a lining material on top uh, underneath your amalgam or whatever material you've been used on top uh, and right, calcium uh, drops. yeah sure. sorry, quick questions come in here uh would you recommend the use of immediate dentine sealing during crown prep yeah i think the current i'm trying to think the paper the uh the american um the reference for that, there, I think, far as, far as I'm aware, but correct me, the restorative guys in here, correct me if I'm wrong. As soon as you've prepared fresh dentine, you can seal that with resin, and it won't affect um, the final cement of the restoration. But yeah, I think sealing. I can't, I can't. I'll have to dig up the paper on that one, a couple of papers on that. But yeah, I would definitely, if it's more than a week or two temporization. You, you've got someone said Pascal Magne, nineteen ninety. That's it, Magne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also <laughs> the, use, the use of chlorhexidine as well. Um, it somehow apparently chlorhexidine enhances it. It, it, it um, as well as its antiseptic and disinfectant properties, it does modify the dentine. And in fact, it, there's, there's some research suggesting that it enhances the the dentine bond as well. So chlorhexidine is quite a good immediate disinfectant to use uh, when you take the temporary restoration off, just before you're going to cement your final restoration. Just give the, the the depth of the cavity if it's if it's deep or the prep uh, disinfect with chlorhexidine. That's something else that has just been suggested as well. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so in terms of the lining cements, this calcium hydroxide is, is the traditional lining cement, not a base, a, a very thin lining, which we put over the deepest part of the uh, dentine closest to the pulp. And pulpal response rates are variable. They can be anything from 13 to 75, 73% uh, in terms of whether the pulp will survive. And a lot of that's due to um, the, the, the environment in which we use the, the, the material and uh, with saliva and lack of isolation. If you've got saliva flowing around in the cavity, nothing's going to work on a, on a very deep um, cavity or an exposure. So this is why calcium hydroxide, it can work quite well. And we do still use it uh, as a hard cement or hard lining, but it, we'll talk about all the alternatives that are out there. So go back to your basic karyology. This is BDS um, from BDS days. Remember the the bugs, the back, the karyogenic bacteria that cause caries tend to be quite specific, lactobacillus strep mutans. And the critical thing is the size of these bugs can very easily penetrate through tubules, healthy tubules, especially young, uh, young dentine in, in younger teeth. 
Um, so this is going back to just be conscious of when you're preparing these teeth and you're exposing dentine, this is where you need to seal uh, or, uh, and disinfect the dentine before it during before you place your final restorations. Um, in terms of the dentine structure, you'll remember the, the, the anatomy in terms of the tubular structure. You've got this S-shaped uh, um, uh, lines of tubules, which from the EDJ, from the outside, the density of the tubules per millimeter is far less than it is towards the pulpal aspect. Now that's important because the deeper you go in, either whether it's your preparation or whether there's caries, the deeper you go in towards the pulp, the number of tubules that are exposed and, and penetrable increases. So this is quite important. Another factor um, is that in older patients, the dentine changes. So with age, which is part of a natural physiological process, these tubules will close up. You get this intertubular, intratubular tubular dentine. This will increase if there's been a historic restoration of historic caries. So, which is a good healing response, uh, a kind of chronic healing response. Um, so older dentine is slightly different, as you know, to younger dentine. Hi, hi, Sanjay. <laughs> just to stop you again there. A uh, few questions that are kind of relevant to that, to what you're just saying. Uh, sure. Is it a predictable protocol we can follow once the care has been removed in a deep cavity to kind of reduce the risk of a tooth devitalizing? I'll come on to that. Perfect. I'll be talking about that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Hang, hang Some of the people here have mentioned about chlorhexidine affecting the bonding. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, it, 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 it in fact enhances it. Uh, again, I can't recall the paper, but it, it somehow affects the collagen within the tubules. So it doesn't have a detrimental, a detrimental effect. It actually enhances, potentially enhances the dentine bonding agent um, interactions or the hybrid layer. Um, so there's no issue with that. I'm talking chlorhexidine at sort of um, 2%. We're not talking mouthwash level. We're talking 2% chlorhexidine, the stuff that we use for en in endo sometimes, quite high concentration. Many thanks. So looking at uh, the classic class two, class three cavity, you've got your box. Uh, and traditionally what we would do, we would, we would put a, a thin lining of calcium hydroxide on the deepest and on the axial wall. The reason we put it on the axial, the vertical wall, is because the dentine is more permeable and obviously it's closer to the pulp. So that's the part of the dentine that's most vulnerable and that's the part of the pulp on the inside of the tooth that's also most susceptible to uh, um, the insult and the inflammatory response. Whereas on the top of the cavity, at the, at the, uh, up here, again, due to this density of the tubules, it's less of an issue. Uh, you don't need to apply, uh, a, 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 a said, an abundant material there. So it's on the axial walls, and the deeper you go, this is where you have to be most careful. So going back to the old carious lesion, so we remember your zones uh, of, of the lesion. You've got the outer zone, if there is any cavitation at all, uh, where you've, the enamel has just, um, collapsed because the caries has penetrated through, it's gone up and down the EDJ and it softens the dentine, hence the, the, care, the enamel will eventually uh, collapse. And that's the zone of destruction, beyond which you've got the infected layer. So where the, the, the carogenic bacteria penetrate into the tubules, they contaminate that dentine. In advance of that, they release the, the destructive uh, enzymes that, and acids that decalcify the dentine. That's, that's the zone of demineralization. Um, and it, depending on how aggressive uh, the, the, the caries is, you will sometimes get, um, and hopefully you'll get some sclerosis within the dentine. This is where the, the tubules start closing up because of the um, lay down of intratubular dentine. Uh, and um, whether the deep restoration or repeated restorations over the, the restorative cycle of life of that tooth, um, hopefully the pulp will naturally form this reparative or reactionary or tertiary dentine. All three terms are interlinked, but essentially they're a, they're a pathological but a positive response by the pulp to try and wall off the, the, the caries. Um, but this only happens if it happens over a long period of time. Okay, so that's, that's how we, we uh, teeth uh, respond day to day from our uh, normal restorative procedures. Okay, what do we do about very deep caries, which potentially uh, on uh, a pre op radiograph could penetrate into the pulp? So, to try and avoid opening the pulp, because once you're into the pulp, it, traditionally we tend to, to say you've got to do root canal treatment. Okay, but could we step back a little bit and maybe not go all the way 
um, through the full thickness of the soft dentine, carries uh, kerogenic dentine. Can we do something else to prevent uh, and maintain the pulp? And this is assuming the tooth is vital and it's not symptomatic. So what we would do is we take the caries away, we take the superficial caries, which is the most infected, we go into the demineralized caries, um, but when it gets to a sort of a leathery consistency, we leave that there, and we can apply a calcium hydroxide, which will have its therapeutic effect. Uh, and hopefully that will cause a pulpal response, a positive healing response. Um, we then apply a usual glass ionomer or as a modified glass ionomer and restore that with your, whatever material you want to use, amalgam or composite. So that's the indirect cap for um, what's called indirect capping for very deep lesions, very close to the pulp, but not quite ex frankly exposed. Okay. What do we do about this kind of lesion where the caries is very, very deep and it, it's pretty much inevitable. We're expecting um, it uh, when we take the caries out, we're going to expose. So now traditionally endodontists, when we see this kind of teeth, we, we say you've got to do endo. We're not, there's no point in messing about with dical or calcium hydroxide. Um, you just take the caries out. We're going to go in and do the endo. But things are changing a little bit now. We're, we're understanding more about the, the, the healing capacity of the pulp, um, the biology and the physiology of it. And as I said before, the pulp is quite a resilient organism, uh, organ rather, and it, it will withstand. Um, and this has kind of brought the concept of stepwise caries, so two, a two-stage caries removal procedure. So similar to the um, first procedure, but what we do is we, if we know we're going to go into the pulp, if we do full excavation, we don't. We stop slightly short over the deepest part of the denting we can just about see the pulp but not quite hasn't exposed we can apply a material there um let a pulp let the pulp to react and we go in three to six to nine months later on and uh, after that period what's happened hopefully is you've got reparative denting which has thickened the dentine at the deepest part of the cavity and when we go back in we can scrape out the rest of the soft dentine that's that's the theory of the two-stage procedure okay so just to illustrate that, you've got very deep caries in this, uh, this tooth here. Um, we can take all the caries out, clear the EDJ, we can just see the pulp, we apply dical calcium hydroxide, setting calcium hydroxide over the deepest part, uh, and then cover that with your glass armor uh, and then restore it in composite or whichever. Um, but the prerequisite of this is we've got to go back in three, six months later, assuming the tooth's still vital, you've got to monitor the symptoms and then get rid of the rest of the caries. Um, so that's the theory behind the two-stage or stepwise caries removal. And in a lot of these cases, success rates are very, very high, regardless of the material, 70% for calcium hydroxide. Now, one thing you've noticed on all these photographs, you've got isolation, okay? So another prerequisite, if you're going to do these the indirect or two-stage removal, caries removal, you've got to have good isolation. Any saliva around the cavity, it's just not going to work. You're going to contaminate contaminate the, the deep denting so good out have, must have good isolation um, and irrespective of whether you use calcium hydroxide or we'll, we'll talk about mta but very good success rates with the calcium hydroxide uh, but on the condition that you go back in and re-excavate the rest of the caries away okay so we've mentioned mta a mineral trioxide aggregate um, which is a material that's in fact been around uh, about 25 years really. It's the original, um, in the, the, the reason that it was developed was um, originally to be used for surgery actually, uh, for apical microsurgery. Um, and the reason for that is because it's a very hydrophilic material. It likes water, it likes blood, it'll set. Uh, and because it's essentially it's based on important cement, which is a hydrophilic material. Okay, um, but its uses have gone beyond just um, surgery and we now use it, today we're going to talk about pulp, pulp dressing and pulp capping, um, but it's for perforation repairs, directly over pe uh, periodontal ligament, vacation repairs and root resorption, because it's hydrophilic and it, and it likes moisture and it sets quite hard and it's got very good sealing properties as, as I'll talk about. So in the context of today's discussion, we're gonna see how um, the pulp reacts uh, to this. And we've got this concept of what used to be called direct capping, we now call it vital pulp therapy because we're it's a vital, pulp we're trying to preserve that uh, and how do we treat this so we've got this um, video it's not my video it's off youtube but it show, illustrates very nicely um, how we we should deal with a, a, a vital pulp exposure remove all the caries from the edj uh, with a slow speed 
try and keep as much of the enamel as possible. Uh, nowadays, we tend not to use amalgam, we're using composite, which bonds very, very well and it could potentially hold the tooth together. Um, so take all the soft dentine away, all the stained dentine. And if the caries, soft dead caries penetrates into the pulps, you can just see a, uh, a little pulp exposure there. Don't panic. As long as it's reasonably small, two or three millimeters maximum diameter, you're going to disinfect that cavity with dilute hypochlorite, one to two percent. So slightly more dilute than you would use for endo. I tend to use four to five percent. So uh, down to one to two percent. That disinfects the cavity, disinfects the the exposure, and then you apply MTA. This is traditional powder li powder liquid MTA. Because of the moisture of the from the pulp that absorbs into the the powder of the MTA, uh, and then you cover that up with the uh, dical. This is optional, to be honest. I wouldn't tend to do this. I'll just put a glass on the lining over the depth of the uh, over the pulp cap and over the depth of the cavity, and then just restore in the normal way with composite. So, there are a couple of factors though that do influence the, the, the success of this procedure. We do know that older patients, um, above 40 years, and any teeth that are over 40 years old, um, they tend to respond less well than a, a young patient. And that's simply because of the pulp, the, the age and the health of the pulp. Uh, in the same way in trauma cases, a, a mature tooth will respond less well it's more likely to become necrotic when it's knocked or damaged with a young immature tooth so some, it's related to probably do related to the blood supply of the tooth um, there is a difference between the material as we know about between mta and dical um, but also an important feature as i mentioned earlier the, the the exposure sites if the exposure is on the axial the vertical wall of the cavity of a class two or class three cavity the um likelihood that the pulp will survive is less than if it's an exposure on the occlusal or horizontal uh, aspects of the, of the, uh, the dentine. And again, that's probably related to the, pen, the number of tubules and penetration and the ease of bacteria getting in uh, on a, from an axial aspect compared to the occlusal aspect. So depending on the, the, the aspect of the cavity where your exposure is, that's something you have to think about. Uh, but overall, uh, three year success rates for MTA in most cases, it's pretty high for a direct, uh, direct exposure. So it's very predictable um, as long as the tooth is asymptomatic and the pulp is healthy and alive. Okay, so the protocol, the clinical protocol. So you're going to excavate the soft, moist dentine on the assumption that the infected dentine is removed and the majority is demineralized, but you're going to leave some of that soft, leathery dentine there. Uh, if, if you don't expose, you do your standard indirect procedure, you, you can use calcium, uh, calcium hydroxide, you can use biodentine, which I'll talk about, or we just go straight to glass armor and composite. If you do expose, and um, it's a relatively small exposure, one or two millimeters, maybe three, uh, you've got good isolation, you disinfect the cavity with dilute hypochlorite, you must make sure that the pulp um, clots, you get hemostasis, that's important. That's probably the only way we can kind of determine whether the pulp is um, irreversibly damaged or not. Okay, if you get hemostasis after two or three minutes of gentle pressure with a hypochlorite pellet, 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 that pulp is probably okay. If you get profuse bleeding, it doesn't stop, then you've got to reconsider um, other options and probably looking at doing conventional endo um, if the pulp is that inflamed. Okay, or if there's symptoms associated, patients coming with symptoms, in those kind of cases, you're probably pushing your luck doing a direct pulp cap on, on those. Materials we're going to use as an alternative to calcium hydroxide, oh, to yeah, calcium hydroxide, MTA, uh, and I'll talk about some of the newer alternatives, which are slightly easier to use, but essentially from the, the family of what we call bioceramic materials or, or calcium silicates as they are. And then you're going to cover that cap off with a glass anima uh, and then composite or whichever restorative material you've got. And pulp survival, pretty high, 90, 98% uh, over three to, three to nine years. But you've got to have isolation uh, and good aesthetic technique. Okay, I'm going to don't be bemused by this diagram, but essentially, this is calcium hydroxide. This is how we, how much we know about how it works. And we've been, as I said, we've been using it in its purest form for over 100 years. Um, but the three 
key things I want you to have a look at here are the its property of being able to induce mineralization within the pulp, okay, and within the dentine itself uh, as a result of the reaction, uh, the pulpable reaction to the material. It's also antibacterial, and that's because of its alkalinity. Calcium hydroxide, when it sets immediately, it's pretty high. 12, 13, pH 12, 13, that will kill most keratogenic bacteria, which is a good thing. Um, it will also, it'll also um, it causes an inflammatory reaction um, and it's quite a caustic material. So immediately on an exposure, calcium hydroxide will cause necrosis, surface necrosis of the pulp tissue. Not deep, but just enough to cause, um, to create a scar within, underneath which you'll then hopefully get a good pulpal um, reparative reaction. Okay, so they're the three areas that uh, we use in restorative dentistry um, uh, and in endodontics uh, and how it works that well. Okay, going a little bit more detail into the chemistry, all you need to be aware of that biodentine, MTA, uh, and all these newer biostrike materials, they're bioactive. The reason they're bioactive, they're called bioactive materials, is because they induce a, a biological response. Okay, they, they're called calcium silicates. From the chemical point of chemistry point of view, and essentially, when they react with water, they break down into calcium hydroxide and they release silica. Okay, calcium hydroxide I've just spoken about. We know we know quite well how that works, as well as its inflammatory pro-inflammatory reaction. It also we know the calcium part of it incorporates into hydroxyapatite, which seals the dentine. It also is incorporated into the dentine pan the reactionary dentine that's created to close that the pulp chamber. Okay. The silica is an interesting component because the silica, as well as being involved in the inflammatory reaction uh, in modulating the pulp response, it also seems to penetrate into the tubules physically, the ions. Okay. Another view of this, this is work been, been done quite a lot on, on biodentine. So so you've got biodentine, apply it onto the dentine itself, you'll get calcium and silica ions penetrating in, diffusing into the dentine, um, possibly self-sealing the dentine uh, and uh, creating the bond that which, which we know MTA and biodentine seems to bond quite well to dentine. Not as good as composite, but this seems to be a, a positive thing. Uh, it also creates a good seal uh, to prevent any leakage uh, under the restoration. So we're learning more and more about these bioactive materials, but this is how we think it works very well. And you get a very good, predictable pulp response. So predictable that the response you get is a very regular, so you've got, MT, you've got the MTA, pulp cap, dark onto the, onto the pulp, and you get this very regular, not quite solid, but almost tube, natural dentine. With calcium hydroxide, you don't get this. With calcium hydroxide, it tends to be more sporadic calcification. It tends to be more porous. The dentine isn't as good, and it is purely a scar um, as a result of the calcium hydroxide necrotizing the pulp. Whereas with NTA, you actually get lay down of regular dentine, which is very, very different and more predictable and more stable in the longer term. You even get a formation of the odontoblastic layer as well, directly onto that fresh dentine and no inflammation. So you don't get this response with calcium hydroxide. Uh, it's a very different um, sporadic response compared to MTA. The problem with MTA is it's very difficult to work with. It's powder liquid. Those of you who've used it in surgery, I know Rob you probably used it for uh, apical surgery. It's not easiest material. It mixes easily, but it's because it's kind of a sludgy material, it doesn't set like a cement, so you can't roll it and apply it uh, in, in the normal way uh, as we're used to for with zinc oxide lesion or glass ions. Um, so these are the original forms that came out. There's many, all the companies produce their own versions of MTA, but biodentine was an interesting um, addition and it's a lot more user friendly because you can, it mixes in a capsule rather than powder liquid and it comes out as a sort of a pellet, not quite the consistency of a glass anima, um, but it, it's in a form that you can manipulate, you can roll and you can apply directly onto the, the perforation or into the cavity or whatever you use. Um, uh, surgically you, you, you want to use it um, you need to then leave it for about five or six minutes once you've placed it you can't touch it um, for another five or six minutes so although it's very easy to place you have to be patient with it and you can't mess about with the material once you've applied it uh, overall about 12 I think 11 to 12 minutes setting time 
um, if you're going to use it for cavity, deep cavity uh, and pulp treatment, you have to leave it in place for quite some time. When I've used it before, what I tend to do is I'll apply, I'll fill up the entire cavity with the biodentine and I'll send the patient away uh, and then get them back in and then cut the biodentine down to a base, to the base level and then restore it with composite or amalgam. Okay. So you need to kind of leave it there for quite a while for it to set. Another new material, which is an interesting one, is the putty uh, form called Total Fill. Um, in the States, it's called, uh, it's made by Brass and it's called, I can't remember what it's called in the States, Endo Sequence it's called. Uh, and this is it's literally like Cabot. You've got ready mixed material. Um, you can take a little bit out and literally apply it onto the exposure. So it's very, very easy to use. Um, the only downside of it is that it's quite expensive, um, but it's useful to have around. And I use this routinely for surgery now. Uh, because it's uh, very, very easy to manipulate and apply, uh, and it sets uh, within the time frame that is required. Okay. What is the problem of uh, this? What's the situation in the immature teeth? So I've been talking about adult teeth, trying to preserve the pulp in deep carous lesions. Um, the reason for that is uh, we need to try and maintain these teeth for as long as possible. But what happens in younger teeth, in teenagers, with the, the permanent teeth? Uh, uh, where the pulp is, uh, the pulp chain space is quite wide, the root canals, the roots themselves are immature. Um, we need to try and preserve these pulps as well, as assuming the orthodontic uh, aspect of the, of the, the case is acceptable. Um, the tooth can, can be maintained depending on the age of the patient. Uh, and the problem with trying to do, if you start doing endodontics in these young teeth, is the long term prognosis for these teeth is poor. We know that long, long term. Uh, if you have a restoration uh, within the teenagers, that tooth over the lifetime, the lifespan of the patient is going to undergo repeated restorations. And once you're down that restorative cycle, restorations will fail uh, and the cavities get bigger, the teeth break, get broken down. So we have to do our best to try and preserve the pulp and avoid endodontics, which is unusual from an endontist point of view, trying to avoid endo. But this is, this is good for the patient. Um, aesthetics, not necessarily too much of an issue nowadays. We've got some very good composite material. So although in the old days, aesthetic with the old MTA, which used to discolor and uh, some of the older materials, we can get away with that um, uh, from the, with the new composites. Another issue is in the um, traditional way of addressing these immature teeth, usually after trauma, a devitalized uh, incisor tooth, for example, with an open apex, you can't root treat that tooth very easily. You have a wide open apex. Um, the root canal walls are very thin. And the last thing you want to do is actually prepare anything. So in fact, when we see these cases, we actually don't do any root canal preparation. All we're doing is washing out the inside of the pulp chain with, with a hypocrite, and we're trying to get disinfection in that way using ultrasonics. So we don't actually use any files in these immature teeth because we don't want to weaken the walls anymore. The next issue is obviously obturating. Because of the wide open apex, we have nothing to obturate against. Okay. The old, old way of um, fashion way of approaching this was calcium hydroxide. You leave it in there for months, 6, 12, 18, 24 months, until you get this a, the apical barrier, what was called apexification. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, one of the issues we have discovered with calcium hydroxide, this is uh, non-setting calcium hydroxide paste, is if the material is used for more than five or six, five or six weeks, it does have a detrimental effect on the integrity of the, uh, and the fracture resistance of dentine. So from this point of view, uh, also it's, it's probably not a good idea to use calcium hydroxide for long-term dressings. Um, and these teeth are already weakened because of the thin root canal walls. So the last thing we need to want to do is weaken them any further. So this is another reason not to use calcium hydroxide for more than five or six week periods at a time. So for immature teeth, things are changing um, in terms of what we're now trying to do. If you have an immature tooth in a younger patient, applying a direct pulp cap and going even further, maybe doing a partial pulpotomy and applying MTA or, or a biceramic material on that large exposure, they seem to work quite well. The pulp seems to react very well. It's got a very good blood supply, very good immune system, and the root will continue to grow. And there's a lot more work coming out on this, this uh, uh, treating caries, carious young teeth. We know about this from our trauma because we've been doing this for a long time with trauma. And trauma is an interesting situation because 
Um, if it presents early after the tooth is fractured, it's, it's a, although it's a big exposure, it's relatively uninfected and it's almost a perfect situation for us to be able to use these pulp capping materials, uh, all these partial pulpotomy procedures and try and preserve that un immature root. So, and this is kind of caught, um, brought around the, the, the concept of regenerative endodontics and even going further for a tooth that's potentially completely necrotic, how can we regenerate the pulp in this? And this is a very exciting area in endo for the last seven or eight years. Um, and a lot of these pulpal um, concepts and the way we treat pulpal, uh, pulp, exposed pulps has come from regeneration. So dental trauma is a big area. Uh, which we need to deal with quickly uh, to try and maintain the pulp and even trying to preserve the tooth for as long as possible until the tooth is, uh, the patient's old enough to receive an implant, if, even if the long-term prognosis is poor. Um, the age of implants, Rob, you probably have to fill me in on this, but it's getting later and later, early 20s, maybe mid-20s, is probably the age you can have an implant because you, you, the patient's continue, still continuing to grow, dental alveolar maturation, it takes longer, teeth do move a little bit. So we need to try and delay the loss of the tooth for as long as possible. Just to drop in, this is a really good website for you guys to have on your desktops and your surgery. When a trauma comes in, it's sometimes difficult to remember what to do in a certain um, type of uh, trauma case. And this is a really good age, age memoir. I can't remember what to do sometimes when a present patient comes in with a root fracture. So this is um, very easy to access and it'll give you a step-by-step -step, uh, protocol on what to do immediately and then follow up after that. So very good. Um, Trauma website. Just to bring you into picture of the the kind of the, the, this research, so regeneration. This whether it applies to medicine um, or whether it's oral surgery or perio, and now in endo, the three main concepts uh, or three requirements that you you need to have predictable regeneration of tissues um, is you need to have a, a scaffold. You need to have some sort of structure within which the cells can can settle down they can regenerate and start doing their healing um, and start laying down the materials and the tissues whether they be fibroblasts or odontoblasts or osteoblasts okay so you need some sort of scaffold and within the pulp chamber um, the scaffold is the blood clot okay whether it's when you've um, exposed due to caries you get that you get that hemostasis that blood clot that's the start of where the regeneration is going to start uh, it's going to it's going to occur you then also need the cells you need viable cells now, whether they're cells that are already there or whether they're um, stem cells which are undifferentiated and they will trigger and change into the cell the healing cells, again, odontoblasts, fibroblasts, osteoblasts. Um, this applies inside and outside the tooth. Uh, you need to have the stem cells there because the cells are going to be, they're, they're the bits that are going to actually do the healing. Uh, and you also do need growth factors. You need chemical mediators that will modulate the inflammatory response they'll encourage the blood system the blood supply to come into this to, into the area because it's the blood supply that bring the cells and bring the immune response in um, so all these three aspects are really key and you need to have all three for regeneration to work and as i said it applies to in any aspect of medicine and dentistry so just to finish off i'm not going to go too on too much about that because it's quite a detailed area but just to show you some clinical clinical cases of how we treat um, exposed large exposures and immature teeth trying to preserve the pulps this is one of the, this is probably the first case i ever did using mta it's about 20 years old it was a eight or nine year old um, boy who came in two hours after um presenting a, a fractured oblique fracture subgingival in the platal aspect um the dentist had put some glass on them just to patch it up and so on the exposure is already exposed clean it up disinfect with hypochlorite, apply the MTA powder that absorbs into the into the pulp chain, into the pulp tissues um, with hemostasis so that the pulp is alive. And I just followed this up. First time I'd use MTA, I wasn't sure how it would work. Um, and after six weeks, no symptoms, you can just see a very faint little white line above the MTA. I hadn't actually noticed this at the time. But when I look, follow, carried on following up the case, eight months later, you can see that dentine bridge is getting thicker and it's predictable. It's not sporadic. It's not like um, pulpal calcification. It's, it's a very definite barrier um, between the MTA and what is, it has to be a vital pulp. I also know it's vital because the root, roots are maturing. They're getting thicker. They're getting longer. 
12 months later. You can see the root length, it's almost catching up with the adjacent uh, upper right one. The root canal walls are getting thicker, the, the tooth is erupting in the normal way, which makes restorative um, treatment and procedures easier as a, as a patient gets older into the teenagers they start becoming more concerned about the aesthetics so you can start applying composite um, uh, as the tooth erupts and I saw the patient two years after the the incident the traumatic incident and you've almost got natural root growth um, not just ap apical barrier you've got normal PDL ligament not quite completely finished growing but the patient's only about 13 now 12 13 but that tooth will last at least until he's older to have an implant if the tooth fractures any further or treat endodontically we've now got a closed root apex if it does break down um, and becomes necrotic we can still treat that far more easily than uh, when the patient came in like this another similar case this patient came in two days after two or three days after the actual trauma the dentist had um, tried to stick the fragments of tooth back on uh, but it kept on falling off because the bonding wasn't brilliant and you can see the healing response this is a actually a positive pulpal healing response i know the pulp is alive because it's actually causing a fungating uh, um, a pulp polyp as we as we sometimes call it and that's a kind of a granulation tissue um, under which, underneath which there's going to be a vital pulp, which is great. What I need to do then is cut that granuloma back down to hopefully some healthy um, pulp tissue. When I mean healthy, it stops bleeding on pressure after three or four minutes. And then I apply the MTA directly on the pulp exposure, as you can see there, in the hope that the rest of the pulp will remain alive and the root will continue to grow and the tooth stays the same. Um, the fragment of tooth, as you can see, it's dehydrated, so the colours are not very good, but that can be dealt with later on. So that's a, a delayed um, complicated fracture, but using the MTA, it does work very well. Another case here, um, Felix, he fell, off, he fell down the stairs, complicated fracture of the upper left one. Three months later, I've got MTA, and in this case, I've had to cut the pulp right back. I've gone into the almost to the mid coronal third, mid third of the pulp to find vital pulp tissue there. I apply the MTA there and then uh, composite above that. Six months later, you can see the change from an open apex, the root is maturing in the normal way, minimal inflammation, no symptoms. And 18 months later, the root is completely formed. So I know for a fact that pulp has stayed alive. We've managed to maintain it. Um, and the tooth is maturing in the normal way and it can be restored conventionally, hopefully uh, for, for many years to come. Okay. Last one here. This is a really wide open apex, very young patients, uh, complicated fracture, delayed, delayed presentation. Now in this case, we couldn't get any vital pulp tissue all the way, except right at the end, there was some bleeding from the apical tissues. So what we did here was we went through the apex. This is slightly beyond pulp and treatment that we're now doing regener regenerative endodontics. We go through the apex, we actually cause some bleeding, we get bleeding back into, into the pulp chamber, into the pulp canal uh, as far as we can. And then we apply MTA directly on that blood clot. Okay, and we follow it up. And you can see four months later, the root is maturing the normal way. We haven't got a blunt, barrier we've actually got the pdl forming normally that's 12 months later oh, and 24 months later sorry let's go back there. so that that root is formed another one here so that's the next step that's regenerative endodontics which is different um, next step from pulpal okay this is predictable very predictable so just to finish off take home messages case selection really is important um, We've got to make sure there are no signs or symptoms that suggest an irreversible pulpitis. In those situations, you're probably pushing your luck trying to do a pulpal expo, um, a, a direct or indirect pulp cap. Uh, you've got to have good aseptic, good aseptic techniques. So we're talking rubber dam isolation. From the pre-op radiograph, you know the caries or the cavitation or the trauma is deep or is exposed. Therefore, isolate from the beginning. Um, and during the cavity preparation, you're going to disinfect with hypochlorite. Okay. The rubber dam is mandatory in all these cases. Um, you need to have good magnification, okay? Within the depth of a cavity, deep carous lesion, you've got a lot of staining, and you need to be able to discern 
when you expose the pulp or when you're in the pulp chamber that that pulp is vital or non-vital whether it's it's hemorrhagic or it's not and you can easily miss this without good magnification good light um, you're going to cause hemostasis with the hypochlorite and then you're going to apply your bioceramic or calcium hydroxide over the exposure uh, as long as it's not too large and then you've got to monitor the tooth it's really important to monitor these teeth for signs for symptoms for vitality um, and radiographically three six twelve months later and you must advise the patient of the condition of the tooth, there is a risk that the tooth may be vitalized, in which case uh, they're aware that it may be their important treatment. But hopefully not. 90% of the cases, if they've done properly, the pulp will survive. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Thank you so much, Sanj. Um, brilliant. Uh, we, we kind of stopped asking questions on the way through because I think a lot of people were finding it quite distracting, so I'm sorry for that. It's just so many people in the room, well over 500 in the room all the way through. <laughs> Amazing. Well done, fella. <laughs> you have the record so far this week. Uh, <laughs> we've got lots of questions. Lots of questions. Let me go uh, back through them. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. We've got lots to do here. Um, let me just... Uh, is biodentine as good as MTA? Uh, yes, there's a lot of research behind it. It's easier to use for routine in general practice. So yes. Okay. Would you recommend biodentine for apical surgery? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it, that's it's very good for apical surgery because it's so easy to use, manipulate and just put it in. Very easy, and it sets very quickly. Actually, um, there's no, the down, the downside of MTA uh, in surgery is it washes it, the surface layer can wash out. So if you haven't got a good thickness of MTA. It could potentially wash out, whereas by the interview, you will never have that problem. Tell me about it. Go back to our old days in Nelson Quattro using MTA. No. I think in a meeting, I said it was the devil's material. <laughs> when it works, it works really well. Uh, people are asking about recording. Yes, it has been recorded. Uh, um, but it, we will make it available on via our website and also. Uh, I've got, is it Sheriff? I'm, I'm on the chat. Are you on the QA section? I am. I am. So. so God, you go in yours and I'll do a chat. There's some questions on the chat side as well. Okay, okay. Uh, what's the name for the biodentine alternative? The putty. Yeah. Putty in, in Europe, in the UK, it's called Total Fill. Yeah. Uh, in the UK, it's distributed by Shotlander. In Europe, it will be from um, FKG. FKG, Switzerland, they're the company that make it. Um, it's actually rebranded from the American product, which is Brasler, which is ah. called Sequence, Endo Sequence. Okay. Uh, is treatment of a tooth with an open apex, a permanent tooth, uh, a specialist treatment? Um, yes and no. It, the requirement is not specialist per se because you're a specialist. Um, you need to have my, you need to have pre high power magnification, so microscope. Okay. You need to be familiar with, um, and be able to apply MTA right at that apex so it takes some training and a bit of skill to do that so if you've done some postgraduate training and you're, you're competent to use a mag microscope and buy ceramic materials then yeah there's no reason why you can't do that um but it, most general dentists wouldn't don't have those bits of equipment they won't have a microscope so on the basis of that it's probably more for a um a, an endodontist to, to do that sort of procedure okay thanks a uh, question here from Neelam. In trauma cases, can biodentine be used as an alternative to MTA? Yes, very good for this. And it doesn't, the downside of MTA, um, traditional MTA is it stains. We, we know after three or four months, if you use MTA in the coronal, anywhere up from the coronal third, it actually stains the dentine, the teeth will go dark. Uh, they have made, there are some alternative options for powder MTA, but it, it, biodentine is perfect. It doesn't stain and it's easy to apply. So biodentine is the choice for that sort of thing. All putty, you can get hold of the putty. Somebody's asked here, how do you remove a pulp, slow or high speed burr? High speed. High speed, perfect. High speed, it's the least traumatic. Diamond burr, um, you, you'll drag less pulp fibers away and it just, it's, you get a cleaner cut and it's a precise cut with the high speed. I've got a few from Vishal Patel here. Do you use sterile cotton pellets for hemostasis of the pulp? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in delayed pulpotomy, does the tooth have to be vital prior to attempting? In delayed pulpotomy, does the tooth have to be? Um, so signs and symptoms, uh, vitality, yes. 
Uh, and when you go in, as long as you get bleeding, pulp tissue that stops bleeding, that's fine. Okay. We have a couple here on trauma, really. Uh, one, one specific case here from Huma Kazim. Uh, triaging a patient this week, and a 13 year old had the, the lower right two knocked out. Mum put it in milk and uh, back in the socket. Did a video consult, consult look slightly lingually placed and high, otherwise, mild discomfort? What would you advise given current circumstances? Okay, so it's uh, Avol's tooth replanted, but slightly more palatal than it should be, and in high preclusion. Is yeah, that right. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you it'll it'll natural it should naturally go back it depends if it's if it's plain if it's um in crossbite then you've got a problem there i mean in the current situation you can't really do anything you, they're gonna have to live with that but normally you would um if it's not if it's in crossbite then you, you have to lift you have to do a bit of orthodontics raise the bite and push it over if it's just edge to edge what tends to happen is the tongue will naturally push it back into position over a period of time um but if it's cross bite, then you're gonna need a little orthodontic appliance just to uh, just to push it back over the bite. But you can't even you can't do anything at the moment, unfortunately, unless they go to an urgent day, uh, dental it's centre. Not what dentistry stops, doesn't it, for quite some time, unfortunately. Uh, well, good yeah. to hear from Timothy. Uh, say I'm not sure how to pronounce your surname. Uh, in asymptomatic pulp exposure, would you remove another one to two millimeters of exposed the pulp? Would it be like a partial pulpotomy before applying pressure in the pulp capping. If it's an accidental. Was that? Yeah. No, no. If you've got pulp, don't go in, into it any more than you need to. Um, as long as you get hemostasis on that exposure. If it doesn't, it keeps on bleeding, then it's inflamed. Then you go a little bit deeper. But if it starts getting to an exposure that's more than three millimeters, you're pushing it then in that, in that case. Then you need to do conventional endo, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Indications for biodentine? I think we've probably covered that. Um, oh. Pulp capping, it's that picture, the same as the MTA, pulp capping, perforations, apical microsurgery, resorption defect repair. What else? That's it, really. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a lovely material, biodentine. So, one person here is a little bit confused biodentine or MTA? I For ease of use, biodentine. Yeah. On its own? Um, you mean for cavity? How do you mean on its own? Sorry. Um, uh, as a sole material, would you put something over the top? Yeah, no. Um, initially, easier to you, because when you apply it, you can't mess about with it on the same appointment. So, what I do, as I mentioned in the thing, I, I would fill the whole cavity with biodentine, get the send the patient away on another visit. Once it's set properly, you then cut it back to to leave a base over the deepest part and then composite on top, acid edge composite on top. Not on the same appointment, no. You can't leave biodentine for that long, for more than a few months. It hasn't got the strength or the integrity or the wear resistance as amalgam or composite. So it's okay in the short term, but you can't leave it there. I wouldn't use it as a core material as well. I would, I would put something on top of it. Okay. Um, disinfecting deep cavities, hypochlorite? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just it's simple, one, one to two percent hypochlorite. Um, the reason we don't use five, so for endodontists, we tend to use four or five percent in the canal. But on, on the evidence suggests at the moment, if the pulp is vital, five percent will, will actually it'll kill some of the pulp cells. So one to two percent is tolerable. So uh, one to two percent. So dilute your hypochlorite for using the two strong. Um, Aras has mentioned about uh, staining of MTA. An irrigant can be used. Can you prevent the staining? No, you can't. So if you, if you want to use MTA for the powder liquid, you need to buy a product that says, it, and there are a couple of companies that are now producing MTA in the, in the old fashioned way, um, powder form, which doesn't stain. So you need to be careful of that. Otherwise use the putty or biodentine. Putty and diet by the biodentine putty doesn't stain. Doesn't stain. Uh, Vishal, Vishal's been very busy with his question. <laughs> the question, uh, would total fill be cheaper than biodentine? I'm, it's a difficult one because they're both expensive. Uh, they come in different forms. The tube of total fill, that's only a 0.3 gram tube, is not much, and it's about 150 quid. Yeah. Now, I don't know how much biodentine is and how many capsules you get with that. So it probably isn't, unit-wise, it's probably the same cost, but it, it's, it, they're both expensive for what they are. It's probably better to get some to biodentine and buy it with a group of use because you're not only going to use it very infrequently. Um, 
So just, if you collectively get a uh, buy buy a box of biodensin just to keep a couple of capsules each in the surgery, that's useful. That's probably the best way of doing it. Okay. Most cost effective way of doing that. Well, uh, one here from Jake Garner. Um, you can you use MTA biodensin in external survival resorption. No, because um, you can use biodentine. MTA will wash out. The only da another downside of powder liquid MTA is it. You need to have bulk for it to set, and also it's rough, so you can't polish it, which is an issue at the cervical level or periodontal level. Um, and because you can't polish it, and you get washing out, you tend to get a concavity developing. So in that in itself becomes plaque retentive. So part the traditional MTA is not good for cervical resorption. Biodentine is possibly. But again, you can't really polish that. So you might have an issue to do with plaque retention. For cervical resorption, I use flowable composite. So you lift the flap, you get good hemostasis for just a few minutes that you need it. Etch, flowable composite, uh, either flowable at the depth and then conventional composite. You can polish that beautifully. Um, and I think there's periodontist surgeons also at least use bio, is it bio? Um, Jerry store, which is a composite material as well. Yeah. Something like that. It's uh, composite's better for cervical. You can polish it, or like your glass arm, you can polish that as well. Okay. So I'm saying about white MTA. What about that? Any yeah, no, it's a bit <laughs> white MTA stains as well. It's not the color of the material. It's the um, the it's the the metallic salts in it that that leach out. Whether it's brown or gray, gray immediately looks darkens. But it, it's it's a long term. As the MTA sets, um, the the metallic salts penetrate through the dentine. So it doesn't matter if it's white or brown. Um, the key thing is to look at the product, let's say non-staining MTA, if you want to use MTA. Uh, I'm trying to think of the company that sells it, that sells the non-staining. Um, it, uh, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. There is, a, there is one product that is now available. It's available in Ireland. It's not come over to the UK yet, um, but you can get it in Ireland. You can get it everywhere, everywhere else in the world, <laughs> except the UK. <laughs> It as often happens. Uh, yeah, question yeah. here from Victor, Victor Chow. Uh, would you recommend rubber dam for all suspect deep? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Look at your pre op radiograph, your bite wing or your PA. If you know it's going to be deep, you suspect it might be because exposure, just disisolate it. Um, you only need single tooth isolation for this. It's quite straightforward. You don't need to do multiple teeth. Um, and once you've got the rubber dam on, then you're quite safe. You can, you can use hypochlorite and uh, and the exposure is safe. And if you have to do endo, you can do a popotomy just as a first stage endo if you need to, if it's that big. Okay. Question here from Lawrence Aitkin. Uh, would you ever... Oh, Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing here. Would you ever do a direct pulp cap in the presence of mild symptoms? You would probably do... If you have mild symptoms, what you'll probably find is that surface pulp would be inflamed. You might have to go a little bit deeper and do a kind of a bit of a partial popotomy to get hemostasis, then you can do that. Yeah. If it's mild symptoms, which is reversible, then yeah, you can you can preserve the pulp. Yeah. Okay. Um, really comment here from Adrian Ripley. Hello, Adrian. Uh, biodentine, approximately one hundred and eighty pound for ten. So people could potentially get together and share. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I know people do that, and that's the best way of doing it. To be honest. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Tris Harrison, how do you remove biodentine on a second visit, visit quickly? As it does set quite hard. High speed. High It'll speed. be hard. It's not as hard as composite, but it, it's still got integrity. So high speed, yeah. High yeah. speed. Like you basically repair a perfect class two cavity, leaving a base there, kind okay. of thing. So you leave the base, the deepest part, and then just prepare it with high speed, yeah. Perfect. Question here from Amit. Uh, what's the role of lead mix cement, and when can we use it? So lead mix is more. That is more of an emergency. Um, material that you would use in an inflamed and acutely irreversibly damaged pulp. So um, it's, got a st it's got two components, steroid, which is the main component. That's what settles the, the pulp down. Um, but it equally, it'll also devitalize it. So that's, you don't use leather mix to preserve the pulp. It's only as an emergency to settle the pulp down until you can go back in and do the normal endo. So in the current situation with COVID, that's, if you've got leather mix on a hot tooth, pulpitic tooth, use leather mix. It'll just keep, it. it'll, it'll, calm the pulp down, it'll devitalize it over a period of weeks until we can go back and do normal treatment. Okay, a so, yeah. comment, comment here from Jake Garner. After pulp capping, why is uh, GIC placed prior to comp instead of just comp? You need, well, this is kind of a personal thing. Um, I wouldn't use normal, I've stopped using conventional GI. i would probably use the light cured GI or resin modified. Um, if you're gonna use composite, you want something that bonds. So it, it probably makes sense to use a light cured 
GI. I wouldn't use composite directly on the MTA because you need to etch and an acid, MTA is alkaline. If you etch directly on there, you may affect the properties, setting properties of the MTA if you do a direct etch. Um, so that, that's why I suggest using a glass arm or a light cure glass arm just as a, a barrier and a hard barrier because it does set hard and then you can use a composite on top. Uh, I think here from Rena, uh, slight, slight uh, change. Uh, regarding two stage caries removal, what makes you decide whether to review in three, six, nine, or 12 months? I think it's, uh, they say you, you should review, you should go back in. Um, I, I think it's David Ricketts who's done a lot of work in this in Glasgow. Anything between three and 12 months is kind of a broad guidance. For me, just endo, I tend to routinely review three to six months. So if, um, just to check the vitality. But I mean, if it's a regular patient of yours, just call them back in six months' time if that's when the regular checkup is. It's more of a logistic thing and just a convenience thing. Um, but you, you're meant to go back in within 12 months after doing that. That's what you're meant to do. Now, there's, there's controversy about doing that. Do you need to go back in? I don't know. That's a, a difficult one, that, because you may, may have left some infected dentine there, which may cause a problem. Um, but. Uh, but anything between three and 12 months, that's what the guidance is for the second appointment. Okay, I've got an anonymous question here. We're hiding. Uh, after endodontic treatment, how long do you wait uh, to be sure that the tooth is asymptomatic before you crown it? Um, if there's been no, no complications during treatment, little or no symptoms post-operatively, I would crown it straight away. Oh, and then if the apical lesion isn't too large, um, I, would just get, I would get it restored as soon as possible. Now, if you've got a big lesion, the tooth is very weak, it's liable to fracture, then what I would do is a halfway house. So I would re I reduce the cusp. I would do this put as an endontist. So before I send it back, I'll put the core in. I reduce all the cusps out the bite and I'll extend the composite to overlay, basically doing a direct overlay. So at least I know the tooth's protected. And the other important thing is I keep it out of occlusion, okay? And definitely out of any excursive contacts because you don't want that tooth to break over the three months. Ten, after three months, you can review it three months for the, for the crown or the onlay. Um, so a question here from Javi Hart. Uh, is 2% hypochlorite used for disinfecting the prep prior to cementing? Now, if, you, if you're cementing, use chlorhexidine because unless if you've isolated the tooth, I don't. There's no harm using hypochlorite, but most people don't tend to isolate the tooth rubber down to put a crown on. So, chlorhexidine is a relatively safe alternative to do that. Okay, I just question going back. Sorry, question going back to MTA, uh, non-staining MTA. If there's ever such a thing, is the yep. you know, MTA two by New Smile non-staining? No. I think that's the one. I think it's New Smile. I've got some in the, I'm actually in the surgery. I'll, I'll, I'll dig it up. I've got, I've actually get a sample from, uh, I was in the, in the Middle East a few weeks, yeah. uh, a few months ago. I think it is that one. It's the new one. Yeah. Um, Neo MTA two from New Smart. Neo, that's it. Neo MTA. That's the one. Oh. That's the one training powder liquid. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's right. The answer. I'll write that in here. Actually. It's on the, in the chat. It's Neo MTA. I'm staining. Yeah. Um, Huma, uh, what thickness should the biodentine be at the base? I would say two, three minutes, enough to have some integrity so it doesn't break. This is so you fill up the whole tooth and when you, when you cut it back, you, you need two, three millimeters of thickness just to, for it to keep some integrity. If it's too thin, it may crumble. <laughs> There's no work research on that, but you need to have some integrity. For MTA, you need to have a good two, three millimeters of thickness of MTA for it to set and not wash out. Um, that's we know about that because MTA does wash out. If it's too thin. Uh, okay, I'm just two stage carriage removal. We've already talked. We've answered that one, haven't we? That's good. That one could go. Uh, thoughts about Biden T. Uh, what? For exposures, you talk about using glass vinyl cement uh, instead of just composite. For direct exposure capping, yeah, you can use glass vinyl. Um, you you wouldn't comp I wouldn't use composite on an exposure direct. So if you haven't got biodentine, you haven't got access to MTA, then glass vinyl is is fine. Um, it, the, the critical thing is as long as it's there's no infection, there's no saliva, there's no caries, um, infected caries, then 
you probably get a long, you get a, you'll get a chronic crisis over a period of time. You just need to monitor that. But glass iron is a good alternative. Okay. Yeah. One from Dave Bentley here. Uh, just going back a little bit about, I presume it's about exposures uh, and about how you place the MTA and how you clarify the moisture from the pulp. Sorry. Okay. The best way to apply is get your old amalgam gun out, mix it up. If it's powder liquid, get your amalgam gun out uh, and just literally just apply it. And that video, I don't know if you saw it, um, or even an apisectomy gun, just to supply it directly on the exposure uh, and gentle pressure with that hyperchlorite soap pellet. That's just, it just gives a bit of moisture for the MTA to absorb and it's an easy way of pushing it into. In. If it goes into the pulp chamber, you don't need to worry about too much about that. It's very tolerant. Um, it won't look good. It won't look very good on X-ray on the bite wing when you follow that, but it doesn't matter. It's uh, you need to get that two, three millimeters of thickness, though. You need that. Okay. Thoughts on using chlorhexidine for disinfection before before capping? The ESC position statement mentions it as well as hypo. Yeah. If you use two percent, you need to use the endodontic chlorhexidine, not mouthwash, which is 0 0.1, 1 0.12, not corsodil or something. You need to use the endo. If you can get hold of that, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. Question here from Angela: um, Can we still use calcium hydroxide? Been to, been can to, do. It, it's, yeah, it's you can still do as long as you've got the isolation um, and you follow off the correct disinfection protocol. It, it still has a good 70, 71 percent success rate. Yeah, you can do. It's the seal and the and the and the, the restoration after that. That's okay. that's critical as well. Question here from Chris, Christopher Tavares. Uh, I went to a biodentine talk uh, by someone McKenzie uh, in Birmingham. Placed the biodentine directly over the pulp. He felt that was, he felt it was better. Uh, any comments? Uh, Chris has done this a few times and tooth remained vital today, even on, on two mil. Yeah, it does. It does work. It, says, it does what it says on the tin, biodentine. Yeah. It does work very well on direct exposures. Okay, uh, we answered that one. Is it being recorded? Yes, it's all been recorded. So you will be able to access it later, access it later on. Um, I've answered the one uh, there. Biodenty more expensive than BC putty. Uh, so that was, how much was the biodenty for 10 capsules? 180 or something. They're probably equally as expensive. 0.3 grams of the tube is 150 quid. It, by density, it's probably cheaper, actually. More expensive than gold, I would. It is. It is. It would, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, it's an interesting one here. Something I've been involved in as an oral surgeon. Uh, what's your personal opinion of transplanting unerupted third molars and replanting with open or closed apices as a preferred short or medium term treatment option? So transplanting a uh, 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 wisdom tooth into the site of the socket of another tooth that's been taken yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've certainly done it for, for sixes and things like yeah. that. And, it, yeah. there's, there's quite a, it's, it's a lot of research going on this transplantation and it, and it, and it does seem to work very, very well, actually. Um, you've got the critical things are when you take the tooth out, you don't touch the root surface, same as an avulsion injury. It's, a, yeah. it's an immediate avulsion. You don't touch the root surface because if the root surface gets damaged, when you start killing off those PDL cells, that's when you start getting the ankylosis and resorption. Mm -hmm. So if you take the atraumatic extraction, there's implant guys, are, you guys are pretty good at doing, um, and take the tooth out, you hold the crown of the tooth. Um, now, and then when you position it, you've got to suture it and, and, and secure it very well with these kind of cross sutures and mattress sutures now whether you have to then electively end some people electively endo outside the mouth but be really careful doing that you can do that but again um, just be very careful not to touch the the, the the root canal surface the outside of the surface while you're doing the axis cavity some people will actually do the endo outside the mouth and then plant it back in yeah, yeah. I mean, see work. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of work going into that. You know? Yeah, well, certainly when I was in Manchester, we had quite a few of those. Um, well, not quite a few, but a number of them, and they were, they did work very well. It was situations where we we didn't really have another good option for the patient, um, and yeah, they they were there certainly until I left. They may have fallen out now, but they were there for a good ten years. <laughs> you do need to follow these up though, because again, it's an avulsion injury effectively, and you've got to look out for signs of resorption and. Yeah. So keep an eye. It may get resorption, may get ankylosis, but it yeah, may close. Close. Well, one of the two, yeah. Um, which is probably about the length of for most implants, about 15, 16 years, we think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So hey ho. Um okay, let's have a look. Uh after placing MTA once root formation is complete, would it be better to do an RCT 
and restore permanently? How long would you? How long after apex has been formed, basically, would you do the RCT? So repeat that again. It's, it, after it's, MTA's, uh, so you placed MTA. Uh, it's a pay. It's a case with this kind of a, 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 a not an unformed apex. So once the root formation is complete, would yeah. you better do an RCT? Basically? No, leave it. You just leave it. Restore yeah. it. Um, until it devitalizes, or you show signs of necrosis, then do the end. end of. So you don't have to go back into these and then do them. Those cases I've shown, I'm not sure what's happened to them, but I'm hoping they've, they're still there, they're still vital. <laughs> uh, if they need an endo, you can now, then do the endo. It makes it more straightforward. Yeah, that's great. Um, towards the end ones here, can, de can bruxism devitalize teeth? It doesn't devitalize directly, but indirectly through fractures, yes. Or an exposure tooth wear, eventually, if it's aggressive and you've got erosion, you've got all the components of, the, uh, you've got attrition, the road, all those components, if, they, if they're that aggressive, and you, you can sometimes get an exposure that will devitalize. In itself, the actual physical trauma doesn't devitalize teeth. Um, either outside trauma, no. Not I'm aware of, I don't know any, any evidence of that. Nick Hill here has asked, uh, can you use the pulpotomy technique you showed for trauma cases on teeth that have a carious exposure? You can, in, in, in the mature tooth. Yeah. Is that a mature tooth thing? Right, that's the next level. I didn't bring that into this discussion, but that is what people are looking at now. So we're, looking, we're, we're treating carious, adult, mature, molar teeth, doing full pulpotomies on them, leaving the pulp stalks in the roots, and an MTA and leaving those. And the initial um, survival over one or two, three years is good, getting good, but it's still early days, yeah. That, that potential is there, yeah. Okay, a uh, question here from Zamina. Uh, pink tooth, the patient comes back month after trauma, central incisor, and just wants the discoloration to go away. So if, as long as the tooth's vital, then that's just simple, simply hemorrhage into the dentine and it'll go dark over a period of time. It's, that's a difficult one because if the tooth has stayed vital, you can't go in and do an elective endo and internally, you shouldn't internally resolve, uh, internally whiten that kind of case. Uh, it's a difficult aesthetic challenge, that one, in a young, in a teenage. I've had a couple of those teenage girls and the teeth have slightly blushed. It's not devitalized. But they want it sorted. It's a very difficult one. That um, there's little you can do. I suppose you can try and do an external whitening, and it'll make it'll slightly hide the discoloration. If it's that discolored, it usually has become non-vital. Very unusual for it not to. Um, yeah. Or maybe okay. doing a composite, some sort of a, temp, a kind of a, a composite veneer or something, just to mask it. They're yeah. the most conservative you can do. Yeah, I, I can speak from experience here, from a rugby injury to myself when I was sixteen. Yeah. And I, I bashed my upper central and where, and it was fine. It was a little bit discolored. Then I went to dental school in Sheffield and they decided whilst I was there that they would um, put composite veneers on it, which kind of worked a little bit. And then they electively did endo on it. And it was, mm. and I can, I can vouch it was vital. <laughs> but it definitely was vital when they went in. Uh, the endo failed and it had an aperceptomy done many years later. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> avoid endo. You, you want to try and avoid it. Once you're down that restorative cycle, it's, it's only one way down. Oh, yeah, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a lovely post crown on now. Think, Hang on, yeah. little, just tell <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, do you use the MTA just in powder form? Sorry, this is Asim that's, that's his question. Yeah, you can do. So, in fact, this is what I do on an exposure um, because so you literally you can pick up the MTA powder and because you've got the moisture from the pulp or, or a perforation exposure from the PPL, if you just place enough bulk, very gently tap it over the, the, um, the wet soft tissue, it will absorb the moisture, uh, the MTA will absorb the moisture, and you, in fact, yeah, you, you, can, you can just do it like that. It's a very easy way of doing it. I think that trauma case where there's a large exposure, you can see, also see powder MTA just on the exposure. That's, yeah, you don't need to necessarily mix it. Excellent. Uh, one here from Mary Mooney. As GDP, if I see a trauma case like this, what would you advise her to do as a temporary measure before referring on for specialist endo? For, sorry, what sort of case? So, so um, trauma case comes in to GDP. Um, uh, usually just place a, a GIC dressing with uh, 
typical layer directly over the pulp. If it's, if it's an exposed, okay, a complicated fracture. Yeah, the first, the first thing is seal that, then seal that pot exposure. Blood GI is good, it's fine, very nice. It just seal, it just acts as a bandage until they can come in and have a proper um, MTA or bidentine pulp, vital, yeah, a pulp procedure, vital pulp therapy procedure. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what's better for a hot pulp? Uh, Don's paste leather mix. Probably leather mix. It's quicker. Calcium hydroxide will eventually kill the pulp, but leather mix is probably the fastest one. Okay, Simon Lee, yeah. slightly different direction. What's the best sealer when filling a tooth? <laughs> In my opinion, the two best sealers are either um, resin-based sealers, such as eight plus or bi-ceramic sealers. I use bi-ceramic, I've used bi-ceramic sealers for the last six, seven years. Um, they have, so they've got the same properties as MTA and biodenting. There's, there's quite a few of those products now. So either resin-based or bi-ceramic, they're the two best. Okay. Not um, to be fusion off anymore. Yeah. Uh, some here, uh, disinfecting cavities, they're a little bit confused. Chlor chlorhexidine or, or peroxide? If you've got rubber dam on, as you should do, hyperchlorite, you can't go wrong with hyperchlorite. Okay. If you haven't, you're doing a crown fit, and yeah. it's not practical to put a rubber dam on, then call Hexidine. Yeah. Okay, another this attendee. Oh. <laughs> if, you, if you've produced an, an, under, an endodontic treatment that is substandard, e.g. perhaps five millimetres short, uh, is it negligent to leave this, or should they re attempt to re-endo? Yeah, re if it's more than... Okay, so the parameters are anything, radiographic parameters, anything between two millimetres short and through the end. If you're outside those limits, that's kind of judged as being, you need to go in and redo that. You better do it quickly rather than letting the cement set. Yeah. Five millimeters, yeah, you need to, that's not. Uh, that's, two millimeters off, you need to redo it. Yeah, yeah. I need to redo all of my. At least it's the patient, advise the patient, yeah. and then not necessarily straight away, but yeah, you need to plan to redo that. Okay. Uh, do you think this. Uh, uh, cheer here. Uh, do you think there's a difference in pulp devitalization between amalgam and composite over deep, deep uh, restoration, deep lesions, basically deep restorations? Um, no, I, I, I'm not aware of any evidence saying that one's worse than the other. If anything, I just my opinion, composite's more technique sensitive, so that's one's going to leak more than amalgam would do in the longer term. Um, but then the argument is, if you put composite in very well, it seals better than amalgam. So. But I'm not aware there's any which is worse or better. Now in the UK, we're using amalgam. It's probably going to be phased out, I would say, yeah. pretty quick for the next year or two anyway. So we're down to composite. Yeah. It's, it's known to use composite well. Uh, someone's hearing about the, set, the hemostasis protocol. Just got more pellets? For hemostasis? I actually use sponge pellets. You can use double O, triple O. Um, Cotton, we get really small cotton wool pellets, but you, I use the endofrost sponge pellet. You can't get those anymore. So you voco, voco make little sponge pellets. So I just soak um, hydrochloric in those. I find them easy to use, but you can use pledges, it's fine. Cotton wool pledges, it's fine. Please sterilized. Mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> the questions just keep coming in, Sandra. We've got to let you go. <laughs> well, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Um, Is it easier? Can you? I'm uh, just thinking. I don't uh, to unmute everyone if anyone wants to fire a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. Let's just see how we can do that. Scrolling through. Um, uh, unmute, unmute all. Okay. I'm going to undo my share. Get out of this. So I think you're all unmuted now. You should be able to speak. I'm trying to think how to get out of the share screen thing. Um, oh, I'm not sure. No. Uh, oh, there we are. Yeah, that. Gallery view. Who's here? Oh, I can't see the other people in my view. No, no, it's, I would probably not activate the screen not that one i don't want to see other people you just start <laughs> impinging oh, on yeah, yeah. Start opening lots of videos it just nothing. i've unmuted people but no i can't it may be something else in the settings that's not letting them talk so i don't, I don't want to fiddle that at the moment um 
Uh, Duralon, polycarboxylate over dry lock, direct pulp exposure. So which one? Dur Duralon? Yeah. What's that? That's a resin. Polycarboxylate. Oh, poly. Oh, poly F. Oh, it's poly F. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, poly F. Um, not really. Poly F is not the best. It's a very hard material, but it actually doesn't seal that well, surprisingly. I know it's very sticky and it's difficult to take out when you go back in, but it doesn't actually seal that well. So, no, poly F is not really, it's not really appropriate. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Small exposure and deep carious lesion. Would you just use 1.5% hypochlorite or hemostasis, or would you use ferric sulfate? No, no. Um, I think Nicola actually is Nicola still here. Nicola Gore, got a batch mate of mine. Is it his name, Nicola? Um, she's yeah. No, ferric sulfate is indicated in in deciduous pulpotomies just to literally kill and necrotize the pulp. If you do that in an adult pulp, you'll kill the pulp. So um, it's only in deciduous. That's a protocol for deciduous pulpotomies now using ferric sulfate, astringent end or something like that. But not an adult tooth, definitely not. Uh, Someone here has asked about showing us a slide. We'll not do that, but as I say, we, we have recorded this. It's Alexandru asking about the zinc oxide. Um, we've recorded this, so you will be able to view it again afterwards. And so that'll be next week, I suspect that'll be live. Okay. Uh, options on calzenol? Um, you mean as a temporary material? So I use IRM, which is basically reinforced calzenol. It's polystyrene, it's rock hard. Is designed um, as a long-term dressing, and it's and it's the usual is quite nice in that way. It's actually antibacterial for quite a long time afterwards, so it, it that seals very well. So long-term temporary dressing, uh, IRM. If it's for two or three weeks, Casanol is still good. Yeah, yeah. Still quite a nice material. Uh, another question from Chris Tavares: uh, Hall technique versus pulpotomy and deciduous teeth. Yeah, do we just let, um, right? This one, what hall technique? What remind me what the whole technique is? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, Chris, you still there? Can you tell us oh, I think. about the whole technique? Let's see if I can open your mic up. I don't know if I can. For some reason, not, not letting me. Um, let's just see if I can find Chris. He's there. I'll have to talk. There we go. Chris, you are unmuted, I think. No, he's muted at the moment. Oh, oh I'm muted. Hi, Chris. Hi, Assange. The whole technique is where you leave the caries in and just put a stainless steel crown over it. Ah, oh, right. And the and the theory behind that yeah. is you seal the caries and it should. Yeah, stop. and it and the, 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 apparently the child has no problems with it. And next thing you know, the, the tooth exfoliate rather than drill and do the pulpotomy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, if that's I, I can't to, to minutes, I don't know what the pedodontic guidelines are at the moment uh, on that. But if that's what they say, um, I yeah. If they can't tolerate treatment, then that's probably the only thing you can do. If you can't go in and do a ferric sulfate, as I mentioned before, just to devitalize it. Um, if that's what is recommended, then that's yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. You again, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> okay, there we go. That's cool. Um, let's. Uh, uh, Do you um, Adrian's in the house. He, Adrian's, you have any references to be ahead for that Hall's technique? <laughs> <laughs> Might be able to help Chris there. Okay. Uh, aha, aha. I mean, here we go. Uh, Dex uh, has just put a good uh, doc summarizing the Hall technique. Ah, oh, you see the beauty of sharing. So if you'll. Uh, oh, right. Isn't that? I don't know if I can, can you all see this? Can you all see it's in the Q&A at the last one down at 324. Good doc summarizing the hall technique. Ah, oh, Dundee. Hey. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor. Chris, can you see that, that link? Hey, I've, I've muted him. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Uh, Atif, uh, you talked about IRM and Eugenol. I gather Eugenol close to the pulp is not ideal. Yeah, no, it, not long term. It, it, it's, although it's an abundant, which is why we've used it for year, decades, and centuries, it does have, it does have slowly devitalize the pulp. There's better materials, put it that way. We don't need to use that as a, a an indirect cap or a direct cap. We've got better materials to use now. Okay. Um... 
Amin, I think we might know who this is. <laughs> do you do you advise two stage or one stage RCT for someone who presents with a symptomatic infected tooth? It depends what you mean by infected. If you mean suppurative, or do you mean pulpitic? Mm. If it's oh, it's a difficult one, textbooks would say. So I'm assuming if it's pulpitic, um, what you can do it in one visit. Yeah. If okay. Purely, if 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 it's symptomatic, there's an apical lesion but there's no separation, you can dry the canals. Now, strictly speaking, if it's symptomatic, textbooks will say, say you've got to do those two visits, calcium hydroxide, settle the apical. But I do do those in one visit sometimes. Um, it's, that's a decision you've got to make on a case by case, patient by patient basis, logistics, patients traveling long way. Um, and if you preload them with anti-inflammatories, you give them a good analgesic protocol after, they, they will settle down. Uh, those cases, Although you have to warn them that they are going to be more, they're going to get more, more post-operative pain than an asymptomatic, which kind of makes sense. So as long as you pre-warn them, manage, the, their, their, manage their expectations, then you can do it in one visit. If it's, supper, if it's separating wet canals, you, you've got to address those. You, can't, you shouldn't be doing those in one visit. Okay, uh, one from Victor here, Victor Chow. Uh, if you can't get within two millimetres of the apex, say you're four millimetres away and you inform the patient, would you leave it empty or temporised with, say, calcium hydroxide, or would you place GP? It's a difficult one. Um, if I'm doing it, I know I can't get any further. Um, a size six file won't go any further. You're just going to make your own canal or perforate. So in those cases, I'll just obturate it. Yeah. If I think there's something there, but I haven't got time to go any further, then you dress those and call back in for a second appointment. It depends how it feels. If it's a definite hard, really hard stop, and the little file doesn't bite into something, then I'll probably finish it. I'll just obturate. But if I think there's something still there, I'll, and I think I can get do better next time, then I'll do two bits. It depends. It's a tricky one. It's done by feel, that one, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dave Bentley, any tips stopping leaking fluid from the apex when you can't get it dry? And how long do you leave it before reappointing for obturation? Um, minimum two weeks with calcium hydroxide. Uh, up to four weeks after to be honest after three weeks it's done its thing and it disappears and just washes out uh, if it keeps on separating my second line of attack would be using an iodide, iodide um, calcium hydroxide uh, there are a few of those products around the slightly thicker and in the hope that the iodide the povidin potassium iodide has a, an effect on different types of bugs if that doesn't work then I would obturate and warn the patient this is probably going to need surgery you can't keep on dressing it and dressing it it's just not practical if it's not going to settle after a month after two three or four appointments it's not going to settle so you then seal off the tooth the tooth itself is sealed and disinfected and then you're looking at doing a surgical nucleation or something ah. if it doesn't okay uh we've got a budding endodontist here what the heck <laughs> I'm putting them off then. Maya, why would you do such a thing? Go to surgery. No, it makes sense. Maya, any advice for a young dentist wanted to become an endodontist? Thank you. Oh, God, that's a big subject. It depends on how far you want to go with it. Do you want to still do a bit of general dentistry but improve your endo? Do you want to do full time endo? Just take referral cases on. It depends on the, there's different levels of courses, diplomas, MSCs, or specialist courses you can do. It depends on how your long-term aim is for it, really. Um, are, there, are there any specialist training courses currently available for endodontics in the UK? Yeah, so there's only, that's, that's the down, so that's the only problem because there's I only three. There's speciality in the UK, isn't it? Yeah, there's only three in the country. So there's King's um, in London, there's Eastman and Liverpool, where I, I teach. They're the only three that take on home students. There are a few others that take on, um, they do specialist training, but it's on overseas rates. So Sheffield, them. Cardiff. Yeah, um, game. Um, it's it's not practical for a UK from your, uh, for a UK resident. They're the only three places to do it. Um, London ones, they both do a three year full time and a four year part time. Liverpool at the moment is three years full time, but we're going to be doing a four year part time at some point. And the part time would be, I think, better for people, wouldn't it? Because is there any funding available with this, or is it completely funded? Yeah, no, these are these are monos Yeah, these are self funded, so it's a big commitment, it's a big investment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's available, but it's a big investment. But hey, hey, we've been, we've both been there, mate. We've done it. <laughs> if you wanted a funded position, you can go the NHS consultant training pathway, but that's that's just 
different route as a five-year training and you do all the restorative specialists specialisms and then you, you major onto one of them either endo perio pros um so but that's then you're going up a different structure that's more of a, a, a university nhs route yeah uh atif and here emergency emergency extirpations any thoughts on placing a fire into a dying dying pulp versus opening the chamber and leaving that a mix on top so i said repeat that question again so you've got a patient comes in they need an extirpation um just uh do you just put a file in there and, and no, no, okay yeah, yeah this is this is in fact i'm gonna do, do a bit of plug here for we've um as um, president of the British Endo Society, we've written guidelines specifically for COVID, but it, it, the principles are the same for any emergency dressing. So don't go into the canals unless you're going to go all the way down. So just coronal pulpotomy, get rid of the inflamed, because that's the inflamed part of the tooth, that's the tender bit. Let it mix with some hydroxide and out. So you need to get in there and out quickly. Don't mess about with the root canals at all. The, the, those guidelines you mentioned, uh, yeah, the website. I'm going to try and find them. They're on there. You can share them with me afterwards. I can tag them uh, yeah. on the email that goes out to people, but I can also put them onto the uh, our Facebook page, and um, so people can kind of get an access to them there. Yeah, good, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, oh, anonymous NHS dentist. Oh, <laughs> put your name out. We're not going to tell anybody. Okay. So complicated endo. Patient doesn't want specialist referral. What do you do? Do you have a go with warnings to the patient if it's a case you know you can't do, or do you refuse to treat them? No, I think on a on a human level, as long as the patients amicable, you know, they're, they're okay, they're sensible. Um, consent, you need good valid consent to explain the difficulties, note it, um, risks of you doing them, what you might not be able to be able to achieve. And as long as they, they're aware of it, you carry on, do your best, but if you really can't get any further stop. Just stop and go as far as you can and then advise a patient. You can watch this as far as I've got it or make a referral or refer you in the future if you get a problem. Okay. Want to are fully aware of all the sequelae, all the, all the, the possible outcomes uh, and write it down because they'll forget. It really is important. Write everything down because patients suddenly forget when it's convenient for them. Okay. Um... Patient that tends with a large facial swelling, patient that adamant that wants to keep the tooth. Do you, do you ever put on open drainage? Um, so if there's drainage, maximum time, 20, 24, 48 hours, no more than that on open drainage. You need yeah. to get the patient back in. Uh, you're just relieving the pressure. You're just kind of changing the, the, the pressure balance in that apical lesion just enough to get rid of the, the bulk of the pus and then they need to go back in and dress it. Yeah, wash it out and dress it properly. Yeah. From a surgical point of view, I would always uh, put a little bit of local anaesthetic in there and incise. Always get drainage. Oh yeah, and I mean externally, yeah, yeah. If it's it large, feels like large it's pressure, pressure. you've got to get drainage. There, you can't leave the pus. Yeah, no, that's it. So yeah. Okay, I think we're. We could keep you here all night, mate, but I think you've got I haven't got patience I'll waiting see. for you. Um, got, um, I'll leave my email address if anyone wants any direct questions. Yeah, that's fine. We, we can put that, if you're happy, we can put that in afterwards as well so people can contact you for more guidance. But I say if you come to our Facebook page, we can mention it on there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, that's probably easier doing that, actually. I'll just yeah, do yeah. Facebook. Um, or contact me on Facebook as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We'll try and help each other at the moment. Um, I think we've probably covered most things in some way. <laughs> I hope we have anyway. Um, 144 people here. Wow. Still, <laughs> you had well over 500, um, but they're still here. They're still, <laughs> we've got nowhere to go. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, any tips how to anaesthetise a hot pulp in lower molars despite showing signs of lum numbness? You can say yours, and I'll say I can say my bit on this as well if you want afterwards. Okay, so I do these. I ID block lignocaine um, for depth of anaesthesia. I then sorry, sorry, no, sorry, that's wrong. Number one, um, ID block with uh, mepivacaine, which is scandinest in this yeah. country, uh, two percent plain. 
if that doesn't quite work, I'll top that up with lignocaine, ID block. Mm -hmm. When that's worked, I'll then put an articaine uh, buckled infiltration just below that too, the six or the seven or around that side. And hopefully, and, and right, so that's the anesthetic, then it's patient management and warning them of what you, what you need to do and what you want to achieve and they're going to feel it. Um, but give them control so they you're going to go in stages and tell them to put their hand up if it becomes too painful the main aim is just to make a micro just make a tiny exposure into the pulp once you've done that then intrapulpal pressure yeah it's a multi kind of <laughs> approach yeah, slightly, with it. slightly different i mean obviously i'm a surgeon so i had yeah. to get to, basically these size a lot of teeth but obviously not to not to end up really treat ended up treat them, but to remove them it can be a challenge uh, I remember going to a presentation many years ago, and I just thought that's so similar. It's an endodontist, actually. It was a BES talk over in I think it was Wales or Chester. Steve Godfrey had organised it, uh, and he's an American guy. I can't remember his name, but what he what he meant he's what they do routinely uh, is for patients who come in with a hot pulp is they'll give them a non steroidal just before they start. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes. we, I do that routinely now. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. four to 600 milligrams ibuprofen, if possible, if they can't take that paracetamol, works very well. Not quite as yes. well, but pretty well. So give them that beforehand. I'd go with ID block, definitely. I'm, I'm happy with lignocaine. I'm not really too fussed about the other materials. Lignocaine, and I, but I do two. Uh, well, one full and one kind of half. Yeah. I'll always inject Buckley always inject buckling to the tooth you get a lot of cervical innovation and you're not going to get past that with even if you've got an id block which works perfectly yeah, also definitely. in fact in the uk um they reckon the anatomy wise if you do enough oral surgery you'll see that there, there are in about three percent of the uk patients there is an accessory nerve that comes off behind or very close to the back of the wisdom tooth you yeah. need to get that as well because it actually anesthetizes the side or your buckle side of the tooth. So everywhere else is numb apart from yeah. that one area. So I'll also always give a very tiny amount of local, just about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 mil lignocaine, just to kind of where the lower eight would be or just to, just to buckle to it or distal to it. Yeah. And just, that, you pretty yeah. much get most of them. Yeah. And for top tooth, always give a palatal regardless, even for routine end, I always give a palatal. Absolutely. I don't take any chances. Absolutely. And if it's going to end and warn them, it's going to be potentially a bit sore. And as soon as you get in there, inject straight away. And once you've injected into the pulp, it'll be it'll be sore, but it'll be numb immediately because it's a hydrostatic yeah. thing. So just get straight in there and get the nerve just out. Crush it. It's just crushing the pulp, basically. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, thanks. Well, thanks. Uh, Antonia, please could you repeat what you give to the patient before the treatment? Oh, so uh, an anti-inflammatory ibuprofen for 600. The Americans would give six. I, I, I do that routine for all endo actually so yeah. pre-op dose now before four to six hundred ibuprofen yeah. uh, or a thousand paracetamol if they can't yeah, uh, take yeah. It. I, I would agree and it's it's kind of a it, i remember the presentation now and i still can't remember his name but it was just it, I, it seems so simple i just thought why aren't we doing that and we start straight away and it really does work incredibly well just one thing we, we were considering about this there's a, been a lot of people on facebook saying about uh, not a lot sorry there's a few people who've got contacts in america um and they use they've got access to um bupivacaine i think it's called marcaine isn't it marcaine yeah it's a long we can only get i think in the uk we can only get it in hospitals or max vax units have yeah, it access to it. you can only get it in ampules so you have to draw it yeah yes yeah, so you've got to draw it up in a, in yeah. a needle so that gives you long jet i'll give you a six seven eight hours of oh, yeah. Yeah. really painful pain the aim for that is just to tie the patient over um until the pulp dies <laughs> for the next few days. That's the aim of that. Um, and they will do surgery, post-operative surgery is great for that. Yeah. Someone here sent us about their ID blocks, not having a high success rate. Any advice? Go back to the anatomy. Rob, can I just break for 30 seconds? I'll be back in a second. Of course you can. I will carry on with some of these whilst you're off. So uh, ID blocks, having not having a high success rate, always use a long needle, never use a short. Um, Personally, I just use lignocaine and adrenaline. I'm not, I don't find any others work any better. And, oh. and there are potential complications. Uh, always think of the anatomy. Uh, always go in so that you just scrape against the bone and then pull back very slightly. Uh, we have got a couple of oral surgery presentations. Uh, Chris Wade's doing one for us next week. 
I've got Richard Moore, oral surgeon from Manchester, doing one about two or three weeks afterwards, and, and I'll get one of them to talk about that area for you. So if hopefully we'll see you again, anonymous attendee. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Intrapulpal articane. Uh, I don't think it matters, does it, really, Sanj? Whatever you put in there. No, it's, it's not about the agent. It's about the pressure, <laughs> basically. Yeah, it's a saline, and we'll, we'll numb it up just as well as anything else. Um, oh, here we go. Somebody said the next question, but views on intrapulpal saline being as effective as routine anaesthetic agents in a BG article a year or so ago. I think yeah. that's, that's kind of answered with that. It's, it's not the agent irrelevant, it's just the pressure that kind of constricts your, your blood supply to the nerve and gets enough um, anaesthesia. Sharif has mentioned it, but yeah, that, I, the, the malahide note, there is sometimes a branch actually, yeah. I don't routinely give an infiltration on the lingual side, but I suppose possibly you could try and get the mile of hired now for a lower six. Yeah, That's I mean, it's, it's really, I, I very seldom give ID blocks now, to be honest. Um, I'll often just, I mean, just with lingual adrenaline, I'll just use buccal infiltration and I will do a lingual as well. Uh, and if it's a case where I kind of done that and they're obviously still feeling it, then I'll probably give them an ID block. But I don't routinely, I don't routinely do that anymore. Mm. I think it's yeah, to do it, and it doesn't, you don't actually need it. Yeah. Adrian's mentioned about Mephibicane, which I use. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. The, the pharmacology, the pharma, what's the word? The pharmacokinetics of it is slightly different to Lignocaine, which is why I, I use it routinely now for as my first ID block for endo, actually. Yes. And also, the fact that it doesn't last for So if I, I can get most of my endo done reasonably quickly. So yeah. it wears away quickly. So the patient doesn't numb for the rest of the day. That's another reason I like Mephibicane, long as it yeah. works. Yeah, Sl slightly off track, but potentially relevant as well to some, to some of these questions. Uh, if you've got an, an area that's, that is infected, so you've got a, a buccal swelling and you need to get through that, uh, the pH will affect your lignocaine, it will stop it working. So yes. if you just inject, inject a lignocaine to that, it will not work very well or at yeah. all. Yeah. So the thing to do is you need to change the pH. A very simple way to do it dentally is to put um, prilocaine in there. So if you put prilocaine in there, it will raise the pH significantly. So exciting. The really? yeah. so Dr. Press, and I, al I always use it, and this is the reason I use it. So someone comes in with uh, an area where there's, there's localized infection, Cytonest Dr. Press in first, just half a cartridge is all you need, and then go in straight afterwards with the lignocaine, and it'll pretty much always work. So just that, yeah. <laughs> from an oral surgeon. We do know we do we we learn something within within our training. Not much, so to be fair. Uh, tips on reducing pain for platelet infiltration, Sanj, what do you reckon? Um, this is all to do with well, there's two things. You can you can use a a, a device called an STA, which delivers things really slowly. It's a very small needle, um, the wand. Uh, for me, you don't need necessarily have to use that. There's two things that, from, in my opinion, that make the platelet not very nice. One is the, the initial penetration. Now that you, there's there's kind of techniques you can do. This is what I call the when I'm doing the LA courses. So um, I call it the samurai technique. So basically, you get the bevel of the needle just touching and resting on the mucosa. And you get the patient to turn into the needle. You don't put the needle into them. Now, psychologically, they don't feel the needle go in because they're turning into the needle. Something I've just noticed. So that's something I use. You can also apply pressure with a um, the suction tip, a small suction tip, right next to the needle. And that, again, that's a kind of distracting technique where you, the, the nurse is pushing on the mucosa as you insert, and it kind of takes the sharpness away. That seems to work quite well. Um, and then when you deliver, once you're in, it's the delivery. If you deliver it really fast and pressure, that's going to cause a lot of pain because the pallet's quite tightly bound. You need to force liquid in; it's going to tear it apart. So that's so you do, you've got to do it, deliver it really, really slowly, low pressure, which is where the, the wand device comes in quite well. The quick sleeper. Um, mm. Also, I mean, surgically, it's the same sort of thing. What sort of things do you do surg uh, for surgery? For good palatals, uh, um, I, I I kind of I was always taught to inject Buckley first, and then kind of almost like to tease it through. So oh, go yeah, yeah. do Buckley first, uh, and then I always use topical as well. I'm a big fan of topical anesthesia. So buckle first, and then uh, kind of go through between the papillae, and then pull it over onto the, onto the platal side. If you've got a patient who really doesn't like it, um. I, Cytonest again is less painful to inject. 
yeah. but platelet, a lot of it's to do with pressure. So if you inject too quickly, it will be be, be painful, whatever you put in. Um, Sheriff said here about routine using, removing sixes with articane infiltration without blocks. Yeah, articane's good, it works fine. Uh, I'm not a massive fan of it. I just don't find any real benefits for me in my clinical hand, in my hands. So I just use lignocaine adrenaline and it works as well, if not better, I think. You have to be careful with articane. Um, I don't use it routinely either, except for buckle infiltrations. But um, if you're using it politely, you've got to be a little bit careful because there, there are, um, it has been reported, and I've had experience of this, you get ulceration um, of the mucosa. I think it's because of the, uh, the percent, the concentration of the... Yes. Yeah. Uh, the oh, I can't, there's two yeah, different parameters. The adrenaline in there, the adrenaline concentration is quite high. So if you put enough in there, you will basically devascularize the area long long enough that you'll get an osteol. So I've I remember doing a medical legal report many years ago, and it was a patient who was who had that problem, and it was it was actually quite unpleasant. Um, <laughs> I just said it was bad luck, but it was that I'm certain that's what would happen. To be honest. Got someone asking about uh, Saranga, Saranga Diva um, final rinsing protocol after obturation. Um, I assume you mean the cavity. Do you? That one. Once I've obturated, I, I use an ultrasonic scaler just to wash out all the sealer. Um, so I've got clean dentine and then etch bond. I use composite a lot now, flowable composite as a base. S, uh, I use a bulk fill something like SDR to fill the, the bulk of the dead tooth up and then composite on conventional composite on top. Um, yeah, you must get all the sealer out, bioceramic and resin based sealer. You need to wash it all out properly. That's good. <laughs> Questions aren't going down. I'm, I'm, I'm going through them, but they just keep coming through. Um, can we put self etching composite on top of biodentine instead of waiting for 12 minutes? I don't know if it'll affect the setting. The problem is self-etching, in my mind, I, correct me on the chemistry if there's any restorative guys here, but it's still going to be acidic in some form to, to, to etch. So, um, and then and bardentia and NTA and all those, they're alkaline as a setting. So you might affect the surface setting of that. It's better not to do that. Just better to fill up the whole tooth and call the patient back in and cut it back and put the normal material on. So I, I, that's what I would recommend. Um, for, for biodentine rather than etching, even self etch. Uh, one from Ella Carter. What did you mean by dentine sealing before placing a crown? Is that a red, resin material you're using? S oh, see, yeah, yeah, resin. Um, I think standard, um, some of these, these dentine, oh, any of these dentine bonding agents, the self cure ones, the self etch ones are perfect. They'll etch and they'll penetrate, resin will penetrate into the dentine uh, yeah. and it seals, yeah, some of those are very easy to use. Okay. Uh, what's the best way for to remove GP? God. <laughs> <laughs> T tooth out? No, 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 no. Don't do that. Yeah, that, yeah, that is that's the ultimate way. Um, single cone headstrom file. I still like the good old headstrom file. Just yeah. wrench and pull, and hopefully the whole thing will come. It will come out in segments, and the whole thing comes out. If it's well condensed. GP, uh, rotaries are very good, carefully used rotaries. There's a couple of new instruments. Well, one instrument's very good at doing this is um, uh, the FKG's, um, oh, what's it called? Endo, um, I can't remember what it's called. It's got a, it's not a conventional file. It's got a kind of an egg finisher, that's it. Not the finisher, the other one, the shaper. The finisher, the sh XP shaper is the one. Uh, the finisher hasn't isn't rigid enough. That's a very nice file to use. But headstrom files try and keep it simple, uh, and I rarely use solvent. I try not to use solvent; it makes a mess. That's yeah, so, so, so sheriff's here said about chloroform, which certainly works, but it's a, it makes it very messy, doesn't it? Um, yeah. You I mean, will... it's really in the UK. You're not meant to use chloroform. I don't think it's got a T mark to be used for dental. Use, no, no, unofficially. Um, <laughs> Again, I've been involved in a medico legal, trying to protect my colleagues whenever I can, and it's 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 a nasty case involving chloroform uh, that was used in surgery um, a lot, and it was one one of the nurses was pregnant, so this is a significant uh, potential issue there. So I, I would I, I would agree with Sanj here. It hasn't got a product license for it. Keep your life simple. Don't use it. <laughs> 
Usman, do you advise EDT soak before and after hypocrite? Um, I do this as penultimate, one minute soak after so between after you've prepared and just before you can obturate or uh, yeah before you obturate one minute so just to get rid of the smear layer and then wash out with hypocrite i wash out with hypocrite not say yeah cool endosol endosol i don't think you can get it anymore but endosol's good um or uh eucalyptol not the old one the new lip yeah, you can get it from qed that's pretty good for getting to rid of gp actually works yeah. quite well uh, down in London, they're still talking. The Eastman, they're still talking about solvents. One of them, presumably high, uh, chloroform. I think they use chloroform there. Yeah, they do. No, London does. <laughs> no <mind. laughs> okay, no, no worries. Okay, I think we're coming up for two hours now, mate. Yeah, yeah. Should we call it more, more than was expected? Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thank you, everyone, for uh, I listening. Really enjoyed it. I, I always enjoyed chatting to you, Sanj. Need a beer next time, there, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness i will meet you in manchester thank you very much yeah thank you so much for agreeing to do this for us uh, as i say it's all been recorded we'll record all the questions the q a as well because that was actually almost as long as the webinar to be honest and i think that's sometimes the most useful thing is is, is getting kind of a bit of background a bit more guidance with these things as they uh, go onto our facebook page uh, just mention on there and then we can try and ask answer questions as appropriate or when we're direct and sanj but i said recording has been made that'll be with or be on the website i suspect it's gonna be next week by now because it's easter <laughs> not that it's yeah. different we're off every day <laughs> but, <laughs> maybe it's easter. um so i say it will be next week i suspect when it's uploaded hopefully we can see some of you again on some of our other webinars they're going on way into May at the moment, which is when I expect this will all kind of get st stop stopping and we get back to normal, perhaps. Okay, so once again, thank you thank so you, Thank you so much. Uh, great. So, great to see you again, mate. Thank you yeah. so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, yeah. And we shall see you all very soon. Okay, I will end. Thank you, everyone. Keep safe. Okay, you absolutely keep safe, everybody. Okay, take care. Bye bye.